Okay, we now have a quorum and we'll begin the COPRAC meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Before I do the roll call, we ask that anyone who plans on giving public comment to please use the raise hand function at this time to let us know you'd like to give a public comment. So with permission of the chair, I'll take roll call. Yes, thank you, Angela. Thank you. Vanola. Present. Bacon. Here. Bradley. Brown. Chivers. Fields. Here. Krieger. Here. Mark. Here. Mercado. Munoz. Here. O'Reilly. Here. And Star. Thank you. Um, Ange, do you have Raquel as being present? Um, I do see her now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, is there anybody in the attendee section who would like to give public comment right now? Please use the raise hand function. Okay, so the first person we have, I don't have your name. Um, it's a phone number. I will promote you uh, to give your public comment and you have a total of two minutes to speak at the 10 minute warning. Please wrap up your public comments. Go ahead. It's coming from a 310 number. Uh, hi, this is Anthony Lewis. I actually submitted a written comment and I am uh, just following up with my uh, public comment in the meeting to uh, say a couple of things that I did not provide in my written comment. And that is that in reviewing the formal opinion again, uh, I think that there is a short shrift given to the circumstances in which these types of agreements for conversion clauses, as the committee has called them, uh, to be deemed ethical. And the limited circumstances under the one scenario where the committee would deem the, the agreement to be likely ethical uh, is very limited and does not at all convey the, the different types of scenarios and circumstances in which uh, these types of agreements can be ethical. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is that when the, the committee says that there's not a per se rule in this proposed formal opinion that the agreements are unethical, uh, it doesn't really describe too many circumstances where I think the the agreements could be deemed ethical, including uh, these types of agreements where, as in the types of agreements that I use, there is an extensive discussion in the retainer agreement about the possible ethical uh, implications of a conversion agreement and that it describes different scenarios where you know the the conversion might be against the attorney's interest or might be against the client's interest and vice versa. Uh, when that's all clearly and plainly stated, I think that that increases the likelihood that these agreements should be deemed ethical, uh, and that isn't really considered at all in the formal opinion. Ten uh, seconds, Anthony. So I, okay, so I, I just think that there there's very short shrift given to the circumstances where these types of agreements can be considered ethical um, and that the committee should look more further or look further into how claims of unjust enrichment, for example, would actually play out uh, when the attorney has been basically uh, been settled out of the agreement without receiving fair compensation and reimbursement of expenses. Thank you. Um, the next we have Deborah Wolf. Deborah, you're, you'll have two minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I was um, part of the uh, submission from the Consumer Attorneys of California who opposed this opinion. Um, and you know we 
pretty, I think, cogently set out what the opposition is in the in the um, um, in the letter to the <clears throat> to the committee. Um, but one of the things I was concerned about too is wondering, first of all, is this really a problem? Um, because it, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be something that's um, a big issue with the uh, chief trial counsel's office that, you know, you're going after attorneys for making <clears throat> conversion clause agreements um, that, are, that are unfair to the consumer. Um, the more concerning part, I think to us is, is the um, lack of access to justice for people who can't afford to pay attorneys by the hour. And essentially um, by cutting off any ability for an attorney to make sure that they're going to get compensated in the event that a client decides, you know, suddenly not to take the attorney's advice or the attorney, you know, manages to uh, get a tentative settlement from the other side and the client fires the lawyer and then they get no compensation for potentially years worth of work uh, and how quantum merit after the fact is not really adequate to assess the amount of risk that the contingency attorney, attorney takes on. So uh, as a business proposition, um, this opinion would essentially cut off attorneys from wanting to have, continue, have those types of agreements with clients and you're gonna cut off a whole bunch of people from access to the courts without contingency fee agreements. Um, I think what would be more helpful, and we did say this in our comment, was if, seconds, if the committee would come up with some language that would be acceptable or perhaps work with consumer attorneys or other contingency fee attorneys to come up with such language. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, we have N.C. Carlson. N.C., go ahead. Good morning, panel. Happy holidays. Um, I submitted in writing, um, and Mimi indicated that she had received it, distributed it to the committee, uh, some comments relative to specific items on the agenda, so I won't, you know, use up time describing what's already been set forth. But I will make one uh, point. There is a, an item on contract revisions, and I said to include, quote, convoluted contracts. I've been involved in some MFAs, and the assessments and standard of review included the findings of the contracts were convoluted and they were deemed invalid and void. So I think that's a really important term to include. The other item, so uh, I won't repeat what's already been submitted to you in writing. The second one, I don't know if Mimi confirmed it, there was a second regarding the referral of an ABA model rule 8.3 to uh, addressing a lawyer's duty to report the misconduct of another lawyer. I submitted a public comment on that on November 30th. So. I don't know if Mimi distributed it, but the, my, the comment to, uh, stands uh, by itself and on its own merits. Um, so I won't elaborate verbally and take time. Any questions for me? Thank you. Okay. Uh, MC. We appreciate it. Is there anybody else who would like to give public comment? I see one hand raised, but I believe that's from the first commenter. Having said that, I think we are finished with the public comments. And this is Sarah. I just wanted to note to um, for the people who gave public comments um, that the a discussion of the ABA model rule 8.3 will start at around 3 p.m. and the discussion of the public comments to the conversion clause opinion will start at 3.30 approximately. So I think now we have a, a staff update on the agenda. Erica or Angela, are you able to provide that? Uh, yes, next on the agenda is to move the minutes, but we can certainly do the staff report. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the, the formal agenda, my apologies. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead. So uh, I'm actually gonna hand it off to Mimi initially because um, she's going to give a uh, overview of a new SharePoint site that um, COPRAC members will be getting access to in the next few weeks. Um, and my apologies in advance that this is a somewhat lengthy staff report. So uh, Mimi and I will both try and be brief. So go ahead, Mimi. Okay, um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, so um, so in uh, next week, you will be receiving an email from State Bar staff um, providing you access to this new SharePoint site. You will use your own email address to log in 
And in order to, well, to authenticate your login, you'll also receive a code by email that allows you to gain access to this site. And what it, we're basically creating, we, what we've created is a collaborative space for our members to work in. And so, um, as you can see here, this is the main, um, the main page of the SharePoint site. Here, you'll be able to click on committee and view the roster. Here, you'll be able to uh, click on schedule and see the meeting schedule. Um, here in administration, there will be folders um, that contain resources for our members, um, including the member handbook and all the materials that was distributed, as well as um, travel expense information like the expense report and the expense guidelines. Also the meeting schedule and roster here as well. Um, there's also an area that we are calling the COPRAC library, and we haven't yet populated this fully, but basically our thought is this, this is where um, you will be working and collaborating with your subcommittee um, drafting teams. Um, so basically, after every meeting, we will be saving the meeting draft, you know, the, the draft that was worked under in the meeting in, in this folder. You will use this version instead of us emailing you following the meeting saying, hey, here's the version that we had worked on during the meeting. You can come here and find it yourselves. Um, or, you know, if you don't, if, you don't work on, you know, if a, a couple of meetings go by because there's no time to get to your opinion, you can always come back here and be like, hey, a couple months ago, we worked on my opinion during the meeting. Can you send me that version? Instead of that, you can find it here. So what will happen is uh, this will be created by staff and a post meeting draft version will be created by the lead drafter. And the lead drafter can go ahead and create this version and it should be named in this naming convention. And what you'll do is you can share this with your with your subcommittee members by email if you want. And so you could click copy link. It'll give you a link. You can email it to email that link to your subcommittee members. Say, hey, I've created a new draft of the opinion. I'd like your input. And you email that to them. And when they click on that link, it'll open this version. So and they'll be able to add comments. So there'll be one draft floating around instead of multiple drafts, you know, let's say Joel's working on a draft and Ken's working on it at the same time. And now the lead drafter has to reconcile the two edits to two, the two versions. We're trying to avoid that and save um, our dra lead drafter some time. So we, this is the new process that we'll be using. And then once you're done working on your draft, you can just send staff an email saying, hey, our draft is ready for the next meeting. Then the final version is what will be posted as your agenda materials. You won't have to email to us or make sure that we've gotten it. We will come to this folder and look for a post-meeting draft to be to be used for the next agenda. After every meeting, we will move these into the archive folder. And after, like for example, today's meeting, we'll save the December meeting draft in this folder. Um, and then in addition, there is also an agendas folder for us to keep a, the, the, it's basically an archive. It has everything that was posted for the meeting there, as well as a compilation so that in case you wanna refer to a previous draft of an opinion, you can easily find it without having to go to the State Bar's um, archive page and click on each agenda item to find it. So um, if you guys have any questions or are unfamiliar, oh, let me also just mention this. Um, on this main page, this is the home page. Here's a little ticker that tells you when the next meeting's occurring. Under upcoming events, we'll list the next meeting coming up along with the assignments due date. Once the assignments become available, you'll be able to click on this and it'll open the assignments document for you. Right now, we don't have a January meeting assignment um, memo, so it's not doesn't work yet, but eventually that's it'll be uploaded here. In addition, there's some quick links here. If you click on any one of these links, um, you can go to the rules page of the State Bar, you can go to the ethics opinions page, the arbitration advisory page, the ethics resource page, and the compendium index page. And these are all resources you should be utilizing when drafting your opinions anyways. And if for ever, any reason you need to contact staff, there are some links here on the bottom that you can click on and send an email to Erica, or myself or Angela, and it'll be very easy. If you need to find our phone numbers, it's easily available too. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, when, when is this gonna be live for us to start using it? So it's technically live. Uh, we do need to populate all the folders. Uh, we'll probably do that Monday, um, but we, in order to create your logins, we need to make sure we have the right email address. If there is an email address you would like to use as your login, 
that is not currently being used by staff, meaning every time we send you some kind of communication, that's not the email address you want to log in with, please let staff know by the end of business today because we need to let IT know so they can create your logins for you. Then you'll get an email next week with instructions on how to log in. Thanks, Mimi. I think this will be very helpful. I just had uh, one follow-up question because I didn't see, I might have missed it. Are we going to be posting the public comments that are received for draft opinions on here too? Oh, yes. So in Coprac Library, once these opinions go out for public comment, I mean, these are all opinions that haven't gone out for public comment yet. But for example, when 21003 goes out for public comment, we'll say, we'll create a folder here that's called public comment. And then I'll put the deadline date of I don't know, just as an example. That means this is the public comment period that ends on May 6, 2023. And all those comments will be saved in this folder here. Okay. And also, just so you know, I like to put the year first because if an opinion goes on for a couple of years, if you go by the file name of using the month first, then you have January 2022 opinions with January 2023 opinions. Whereas if you organize it by year first and then the month and the date, then it, it just makes more sense. Understood. And we do have public comments for the conversion clause opinion, though, right? Yes. Okay. Um, we, we I literally was working on this last night, <laughs> and like we uh, no, I, had access last night, and but this will all be populated. I will go back and any opinion that is currently on the agenda on our current agenda, including ones that have gone out for public comment, we will add those public comments to those folders. Perfect. Okay. Thanks for your help. That that's gonna be very useful. Um, I think Raquel has a question. I do. Thank you. Um, very, I think it'd be very helpful. I've used SharePoint with other boards and it's helpful. I do have two questions. Um, the first one in the COPREC library, mm -hmm. what is the access allowed for committee members that are not part of the working group? Can we view only or what, what, what's our level of access? And then the second question is related to the agenda folder. Um, are you going to be putting all of the material that you now PDF or say go to the site in there before the meeting or only post the meeting? Okay. Oh. Now, you, to your first question, when it comes to the COPRAC library, any COPRAC member can access any of the documents in there, whether you're on the drafting team or not. Mimi, let me actually interrupt you on that because that's actually, uh, so because this, this committee is required to follow Bagley Keene, the Open Meeting Act. And so any interim work on these drafts during between meetings, it really should be the working group that is exclusively working within these documents, including viewing them, because that's information that's not being provided to the public um, at a properly noticed meeting. So I, I would actually ask that if you are not on a working group for one of these, that you do not work within that folder until that information is um, available and publicly posted for the next meeting. So for example, for the July, I'm sorry, for the January 13th meeting, that information would be posted likely on January 3rd. Um, and so we would ask that you wait until that information is publicly posted to avoid any concerns surrounding Bagley Keene. I will add one more thing. When it comes to these COPRAC library folders, feel free within the subcommittee, your drafting team, if you want to add cases that you can upload cases in PDF or in Word, you know, any kind of resources having to do with your opinion, you know, um, you feel free to upload those things so that your drafting team can access them as well. You know, if someone has a suggestion, hey, we should add this case to the opinion. Well, I haven't seen that opinion, then feel free to go ahead and add any articles, you know, um, secondary resources, opinions to those folders. You, you have a lot of, um, you know, we're, you have a lot of um, like flexibility as to what can go in that folder. It's a working folder for your drafting team. Um, in regards to your second question, uh, Raquel, only things that are, we will post in this folder, the items that are on the same day that they're uploaded to this website. It will not appear sooner than that. Yeah, thank you. No uh, do we have, the drafting team or the lead drafter <clears throat> have any controls on accepting edits as we go along or how does that work? Well, I think that what we're thinking is this, that if once you open a document, you would make any changes in track changes, um, just so that one, if you, when you do it in track changes, you can actually see who decided to add this language. It, it appears in the reviewing pane and you could always add comments 
um, to the document um, as you would in Word. So, and they would say, hey, I decided to add, you know, the new language that you insert or delete, you would highlight it, new comment, click new comment. And you would say, hey, I decided to add this language. What do you guys think? And then the lead drafter, when they're going through the document and seeing what changes have been made by the drafting team can decide whether to keep or to reject the change that's been made. Okay. Thank you. Randy? Uh, along the lines of Joel's question, the protocol for making changes to the actual working draft between meetings, I understand SharePoint will, will give you the ability to track backwards to earlier versions, but should there be more than one working version? Should there be iterative file names between meetings for different versions? How, how should the committee proceed for that? Be, wait, multiple versions between two meetings though? Or for each meeting, there should be a different version? Um, I guess the question would be for both situations. Uh, is or, there only gonna, in SharePoint, it's a collaborative document and the SharePoint environment allows you to backtrack to prior versions but do we want to have only one version of the opinion for the life of the opinion? No, no, that's not. Or do we it's continue to have uh, new versions that we can actually identify by a different file name? Yes. So, for example, just as an example, following the October meeting, a October fourteenth meeting draft was created, and you see it here that it's um it says October fourteenth. Then the post meeting draft is following the October fourteenth meeting. This is the working draft. Then the working draft becomes today's version that's posted for the agenda, which is the January, um, not the January, sorry, December draft. Tomorrow or today after this meeting, we will upload here a January 2nd, I mean, I'm sorry, a December 2nd draft. This is the next iteration of the draft, a January 2nd meeting draft. The drafting team will then create a post meeting draft and that will be used until the January meeting. You see what I'm saying? So we will keep each one of these drafts every meeting, a new meeting draft will be created. So there will be different versions, one version between each meeting, but not multiple versions, because that's what we're trying to avoid here, having five versions floating around for the lead drafter to try to reconcile in, in their review. Does that make sense? Or does anybody else need clarification on what I just said? So the starting point between meetings is the meeting draft. But when you Correct. open that and edit it for the first time, you should name it the post meeting draft. Correct. You're going to And everybody that. will work within that, collaborate within that. If the working group needs to meet to resolve and accept changes before finally submitting it, they stay in that one draft until it becomes the submission from the team for the agenda. Yes, that's correct. Perfect. That that works. Anyone else? And if you guys have any questions and don't want to ask now, or if you think of something later, feel free to reach out to me. If you want another demonstration, I'm happy to give you a one-on-one -on -one de one -on -one de demonstration. Just let me know. I just had one follow-up question, Mimi. I thought, did you say that um, on the assignment deadline, you're just going to pull the post-meeting drafts from SharePoint, or should we still email them to staff when they're just shoot us a message you don't need to email it to us we'll go here we'll retrieve it also you don't have to create a red line we will create the red line for you we will take whatever is posted here make a clean version and then run a red line to the previous meetings clean version and that will be the red line you guys don't need to do it uh we'll take care of that just okay. send us a message saying my draft is ready to go it's in the folder That's okay we can post some instructions related to all of this on the SharePoint site so that, you know, a month from now, you're not wondering what to do. Um, just as kind of best practices for, as it relates to all this. I think that might be helpful for the group. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Mimi. Okay. okay, so I have a few um, high level things to talk through and I will try and be brief. Um, the first one being changes as it relates to committee administration. So um, I think it was at our July meeting, I talked about how the Board of Trustees had approved uh, the use of Rosenberg's rules of order, replacing Robert's rules for conducting meetings. Uh, this has now gone into effect officially as of the Board of Trustees November meeting. And the main changes, I'm not going to highlight everything, but the, the, high, the main change is that 
the chair can now more fully participate in the committee's decision making, including the ability of the chair to uh, make a motion or second a motion, as well as the ability of the chair to vote in instances um, more than just when there's a tie. Uh, and so uh, that is going to go into effect effect of this meeting. So Sarah, you're going to get to vote. Uh, and um, the, the chair's name, however, will be called last to continue to facilitate, you know, discussion and uh, not to kind of, you know, uh, uh, indicate anything prior to the, the chair's vote. Um, as it relates to public comment, as you heard earlier today, um, public comment is now being allowed for uh, up to two minutes, uh, or actually no, no fewer than two minutes for, for most committees. And there are also other ways for um, in which a member of the public can submit their public comment now. So um, we have typically received public comment in written form via email to either the committee coordinator or to the chair. Um, there's going to be um, an opportunity for individuals to submit public comment to a centralized email address at this point, and there'll be instructions for the public on how to do that as well as they're going to be encouraged to actually submit their comments in writing at least 24 hours prior to the start of a meeting. And those will be circulated to the full committee. Uh, additionally, uh, individuals can now effective, this is all effective at the January meeting, let me be clear there, excuse me. Um, members of the public can also continue to submit oral public comment at the beginning of a meeting or whenever the chair calls for public comment. Um, however, they're going to be offered the opportunity to sign up to give public comment in advance. Uh, this committee, for the most part, it's it's not a, a, the we don't necessarily have it where you know there's hours of public comment um, at the beginning of a meeting, but it will better inform the amount of public comment we're likely to receive, so that the um, the meeting can be um, organized in a manner that facilitates public comment as well as the the work of the committee. Uh, so that's essentially all I have as it relates to kind of these administrative matters. And then if there's no questions, I'll kind of dive into a brief update on what happened at the Board of Trustees November meeting as it relates to some of the work of the committee. Raquel? <laughs> Any consideration given for people to, to leave voice notes, messages, or only written? Uh, right now, it's limited to writing, um, but I, I mean, we can certainly explore that. I don't think that that's necessarily, I, I think that's something we would be open to. We'd have to uh, kind of figure out who's, who's phone number to, to send it to and, and so forth, but that's something we could certainly look into. And then the, the same thing that would be distributed likely via email to the committee members. Okay. And then, or, and, or could this be played at the meeting? Correct. That's how I've seen it done. Over. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so I'm going to um, briefly share my screen. I just have a very quick uh, PowerPoint high level overview. Uh, so let me share. And can everyone see this slide presentation? Great, seeing a thumbs up. Thanks Raquel. Okay, so um, most of these items relate to the um, California Civility Task Force recommendations that um, COPRAC considered in part as related to the rules of professional conduct. So, um, let me get, there we go. So just a brief, you know, I'll try to provide a brief overview of CCTF's recommendations and then uh, discuss what the Board of Trustees decided to issue for public comment in regards to those recommendations. So as you'll recall, uh, CCTF was a joint project of the California Judges Association and the California Lawyers Association. And um, essentially the report discussed the fact that incivility is causing, um, you know, stress and job dissatisfaction, and it's impacting uh, clients and the public, as well as kind of the legal system as a whole. And their recommendations, uh, there were four in total, but three of them related to attorneys. And those recommendations were to require an hour of uh, civility training as part of the MCLE requirements, changes to the rules of professional conduct, which this group is very familiar with, and then to require all lawyers to take a civility pledge. So starting with the proposed changes to the MCLE requirements, uh, the Board of Trustees voted to issue for a 60-day public comment period um, certain changes to these MCLE requirements. Just a brief note, all of them will exist within the current requirements of completing 25 hours of MCLE every 36 months. So right now, the course requirements for MCLE are four hours of legal ethics, two hours of recognition and elimination of bias with one hour of implicit bias, and one hour of competency, which is substance use or other issues that impair a licensee. 
The proposed requirements that were issued for public comment include um, changes to the course requirements to expand those course requirements. So still within the same 25 hours, but um, some of those changes include expanding competency from one hour to two hours. One of those hours would continue to be required to be in the substance use and um, other issues that may impair licensee, but an attorney could take that additional second hour as what's called a wellness competency course. Um, and so those are things that uh, more broadly relate to um, you know, wellness and physical and mental wellness, so long as they still continue to relate to the practice of law. Alternatively, an attorney could continue uh, could just take two hours that related to the substance use issues. Um, related to these recommendations were also uh, changes to one hour of technology in the practice of law. Uh, that was based on kind of a staff evaluation of um, MCLE that's required in other jurisdictions. And then going back to what CCTF recommended, a one hour requirement on civility in the legal profession. Any questions on that and oh go ahead sir you said these been out for um public comment have they been published for public comment already and what is the deadline yeah so they had all of these have um officially been posted for public comment um they were posted either yes i believe it was yesterday that they were posted okay. and the public comment period for all, everything i'm discussing today is uh it ends january 30th okay thank you and then so one other change to the MCLE rules would be to allow for a participatory MCLE credit for certain mock trial and moot court activities. It would allow for up to two hours of general credit during that three year compliance period for um, particular activity such as coaching students, serving as a scorer and or a presiding judge over these mock trial and moot court competitions at the high school level and higher. Okay. So moving along to maybe what people are most interested in hearing about is the action that occurred as it related to um, the uh, COPRAC's recommendations regarding the rules of professional conduct. So where we left off was that uh, COPRAC was recommending amendments to rule 1.1 comment one and rule 8.4 comment six, um, and then also in the alternative recommending a standalone rule. Uh, that information was um, presented to the Board of Trustees as that transmittal memo that uh, COPRAC worked on. And thank you again for everyone for your hard work on that item. And um, staff also drafted a standalone rule in advance of the Board of Trustees meeting based on uh, COPRAC's recommendation that a standalone rule might be issued. So um, those things were originally presented to the Board of Trustees as essentially alternative. So it would have been um, as two options for the public comment period to um, issue Rule 1.2, Comment 1, and 8.4, Comment 6 as a possible amendment via um, for public comment. And then alternatively, the standalone rule, what has been drafted as Rule 8.4.2, as an alternative as a, an individual standalone rule, and that was going to be issued for public comment. Um, Staff provided this information to uh, Justice Brian Curry, who was chair of the Civility Task Force, and he um, uh, participated in the Board of Trustees meeting in November and recommended, and the board agreed with this recommendation, that this all be um, issued as a, as a uh, comprehensive change to the rules of professional conduct, meaning that um, we're seeking, the State Bar is seeking input on all of these changes as one change. So changes to 1.2 comment one, changes to uh, 8.4 comment six, and the new standalone rule 8.4.2. Um, there would also be a, a minor amendment to rule 8.4 comment four, which is a, essentially just a cross reference to that new rule on incivility. So um, the changes to 1.2 and 8.4, this committee is already aware of, that's what you authorized at our um, October meeting. And then just very high level, the changes to 8.4, or the new rule, excuse me, 8.4.2 um, has only uh, two paragraphs, one saying that a lawyer shall not engage in incivility in the practice of law or related professional activities, and then subparagraph B defining what incivility is. And this is largely based on um, COPRAC's uh, recommended edits to those CCTF rules, assuming that they would have been um, progressed by the Board of Trustees. And then also associated with Rule 8.4.2 are uh, several comments. 
which do the same thing as what was discussed at COPRAC's October meeting, directing lawyers to consult um, civility authorities, uh, explaining conduct that would not violate the rule, uh, indicating that a violation of the standalone rule could also result in violations of other rules of professional conduct, including 8.4D and the State Bar Act, and clarifying that the rule does not apply to con conduct that's protected by the First Amendment or the California Constitution. I'll pause here for a second before diving into the attorney oath, but if anyone has any questions. Let's see, I can't see everyone, but I don't think anyone does. So I'm gonna move very quickly on to the proposed amendments to the attorney oath. And that's um, California rule of court 9.7. So, uh, all relatively new admittees to the state bar have been required to take their attorney oath with certain civility language associated with it. And that's been since June of approximately June of 2014. And that language is as an officer of the court, I will strive to conduct myself at all times with dignity, courtesy, and integrity. Uh, most licensees were admitted prior to June of 2014. So most individuals have not um, taken the oath with that civility language. Uh, what is being proposed and is currently issued for public comment is that by February 1st of 2024, any licensee who did not take the oath with the civility language, as well as any um, specially admitted attorney. So those are attorneys who are not licensed in California, but are authorized to practice based on um, the special admissions or MJP rules, uh, which are within the California rules of court, such as registered in-house counsel, uh, military spouses, and, and others. Uh, would have to submit a declaration with the civility pledge language. And then on an annual basis, when paying your licensing fees or um, you know, indicating your compliance with the minimum continuing legal, legal education requirements, uh, licensees would also be required to uh, essentially check the box indicating that they agree to abide by that civility pledge. And that's everything I have there. So I'll stop sharing. Um, just again, all of these have now been issued for a public comment period. Uh, that public comment period ends on January 30th. Um, and then very briefly, and I know this is long, so my apologies. I just wanted to remind everyone um, that uh, CTAP, the Client Trust Account Protection Program has gone into effect as of yesterday. Uh, so the rules affecting that don't technically go into effect until January 1st of 2023. However, um, just like you can pay your license uh, fees in advance of the typical requirements that go into effect in January, you can also start submitting compliance, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, reporting and registering as required within CTAP uh, starting now with a minor caveat to that, which is that um, if you do maintain a client trust account and you're going to essentially answer yes to the initial threshold question of whether or not you do so, you'll have to report the year-end balance of any uh, client trust account, including an IOLTA account, uh, on December 31st. So you'd be able to uh, complete a portion of these reporting and registration requirements, but you wouldn't be able to do the um, fully completed until on or after uh, December 1st of this year. Uh, attorneys have till February 1st to comply. However, any penalties for non-compliance aren't going to go into effect until April 3rd because this is the first year that CTAP is being required of all um, life, or CTAP compliance is being required of all licensees. And the reason I'm pointing this out is um, mainly because there's a lot of resources related to this that have been provided on the State Bar's website. Um, there's just like a, a high level uh, web page that talks about what CTAP is and how to comply. Um, an aspect of CTAP is completing some self-assessment questions. A preview of those self-assessment questions is provided on the website. And um, right now there's a lot of trainings that are being offered by the State Bar as it relates to CTAP compliance. So Office of Professional Competence um, and our new staff, uh, our new senior attorney, Kathy Ongiri, who I believe you guys met at a prior meeting, has really spearheaded this effort and she's offering a free one hour MCLE as it relates to uh, the new CTAP requirements and general trust account practices. And then another office, the uh, State Bar's Division of Regulation is offering uh, trainings on how to essentially uh, report and register. So going through your My State Bar profile to do that. 
as well as for law firm and organization administrators who may be reporting client trust account information on behalf of attorneys, giving them a training so that they know how to do that. So that's my brief overview of CTAP. And I have one last thing that will take like one minute, but I wanna pause here for questions on that. All right, seeing none. Um, the only, the final thing I wanted to talk about very briefly is uh, the ethics symposium, which, you know, uh, is, is put on by COPRAC. So the symposium is scheduled for Friday, April 21st. And following this meeting, uh, staff will be circulating a list of the past topics so that you can see what has been presented on. I believe we typically, you know, give everything for the past 20 years or so, but Mimi, Mimi will be providing that information. Um, and we're going to ask that you provide any uh, possible topic ideas to staff with kind of a few sentences explaining what that topic may look like, kind of flush it out a little bit in advance of our next meeting on January 13th so that we can finalize topics of that meeting and really begin development of uh, the event. And that is everything. Thank you everyone for listening to me talk. Thanks, Erica. Um, and I think the next, well, actually, before we move on to the next item on the agenda, um, I think we should, um, if someone wants to move to approve the minutes from the last meeting. I'll move. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, and going forward, uh, when we make uh, motions and seconds, if you can just state your name, that would be greatly appreciated. So I will go ahead and take the vote to approve the minutes from the October meeting. Bacon? Yes. Brown? Yes. Bradley? Chivers? Krieger? Yes. Mark? Yes. Mercado? Munoz? Yes. O'Reilly? Yes. Starr? And Benola? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Okay, thank you. And I think the first item um, on our agenda, the first opinion is a draft opinion 20.0002 regarding succession planning. Um, does the lead drafter want to start? Um, or Justin, it looks like you submitted it um, re for the this meeting. So if you wanted to start as well and just discussing the edits that were made to that opinion. Sure. So um, the edits are minimal, so I'll be pretty brief here. Um, this opinion, um, thanks in, in large part to, to Dina, was in pretty good shape um, before her departure. Um, so in terms of the next steps, we just tried to look at this sort of with a fresh set of eyes, do some light cleanup, raise a couple questions, and then um, hopefully uh, get the committee's feedback on any further substantive questions or refinements that everyone thinks would be helpful to consider or make. And then I think we'll be in a position hopefully to um, get this out for public comment in the next couple meetings. So just to, to highlight, for instance, I mean, with the digest, we've got to flesh that out, right? We haven't done that yet. Um, the, the, the main edits are as follows on uh, around line 73 and 89, just some simplifying of the background facts. Uh, there were a couple minor details that seemed superfluous, so took those out. Um, some wordsmithing that I won't um, address. And then around line 207, um, I raised sort of a gut check question and wanted the committee's feedback on whether you think we need this or clause or whether it kind of seems either out of place or going a, maybe a step too far in terms of offering a specific recommendation about sharing passwords with family members. It seemed to me that the um, sentence starting at line 203 of the red line where it says here offers sort of the high level uh, recommendation, if you will. And so I, I see the or clause as um, not bad um, or and not, un, un, you know, I'd be fine with it, but but I really would like the, the committee's feedback on whether you think it's a, 
a step too far um, than, than where we want to go and, and whether we should just take that out or not. Um, and let's see if there's anything else. Again, mostly this was just wordsmithing. We obviously have to um, prepare a conclusion, um, but that's that's really it. So um, if you have any other sort of substantive edits, questions, uh, your thoughts on that um, sentence at line 207, those are the, the, the subjects that it would be helpful to get input on today. what I got. On, on that issue, Justin, um, just reading it here, it seems like there's an issue of uh, maintaining client competences. I don't know how deep that would go, but that's just something that popped into my head as I was reading that, that do we want to, and this goes really to your question of having that or pair, sentence in there is, do we want to have a non-lawyer um, with that type of access to client files. Right. I, I, yeah. No, I appreciate you articulating that, and and I um, because that's the concern that's in my mind that I didn't maybe uh, share as as well as I should have. It, it may very well be that there are certain circumstances where this or clause is appropriate, but I don't know that you know in the abstract we want or need to go there, given that that type of sharing implicates the confidentiality issue that Bill raised. And, you know, it's an option that could arise out of a lawyer considering his or her options based on what we already say in that first sentence. So the or clause without further nuance, without addressing the client, client competency issue or co confidentiality issues, rather, um, we might be stepping in something we don't we don't intend to, and so that was the concern. So I, I appreciate you articulating that. Yeah, Justin, the the follow up thought I had was that obviously, if you're um, working in a law office setting and you have staff, they would be within the ambit of people who, uh, if they were given access, would not violate your obligation to hold uh, the client confidences. On the other hand, uh, for my situation, uh, I'm just on my own. And so the only person that I might have do it would be, say, my wife. And uh, what thought should we be giving to creating rule changes that might permit safe harbor for uh, those types of situations? Or there should be a list of uh, safe harbor personnel that could be given access to this kind of information in the event we become incapacitated. And if uh, that's the standard, then what is incapacity? Is it temporary? Is it permanent? Is it, you know, loss of your law practice or something like that? Um, I just think we need to get some further thought to thinking all that through, given that the uh, 606AD is pretty, um, uh, you know, it's a hard and fast statutory obligation. And uh, if we're going to contemplate broadening the exceptions to, or the ambit of people who would be uh, within that uh, right of access without violating 606 at a, we're going to have to give some further thought to that. That's all. Right. I, I think that um, one of the challenges we have here if we kind of go into the weeds uh, on these issues is we have the, the current rule framework, uh, the current statutory framework to confront because we're not going to be able to affect the rule change by virtue of our ethics opinion. And so navigating those concerns as they presently um, stand based on the current rules and statutes is, is the, the challenge here because we would need to do some, um, you know, we would have to be pretty careful about what we say here, I think. Um, it's not to say we shouldn't, but but it would require, I think, further explication if we keep the or clause in. Hey, Justin, this is Dan. Um, I, we're, we're seeing something happen a lot 
with clients that I think is going to be a bigger succession challenge, which is the lawyer who has incapacity due to dementia. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if there were some place that there's no solution to it that we could do within the scope of this, but is there a place that you could reference in the context of the lawyer's duty? Because unlike the physical you know, hospitalization or something that might happen suddenly or an accident, dementia happens um, gradually. You may have a diagnosis of it. On the other hand, one of the initial um, symptoms is uh, lack of recognition and lack of sort of acceptance of it. So it's a special, really difficult problem, but it might merit some kind of a reference because it's going to be, I think, very, very common. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting and challenging point that you raise. I think a lot of this opinion focuses on this assumption that the uh, event that occurs that incapacitates the lawyer is unexpected, right? And, and as opposed to gradual and a lawyer sort of having the awareness <laughs> before the fact um, that that his or her mental capacity could diminish affecting judgment and, and accounting for that before it happens. Um, getting lawyers to think about that type of issue, I, I agree with you, is, is important. Um, and so maybe that's a, a thought that we need to, to, to work in, even if it's just in a, in a you know, a, a, given the, the structure of the current opinion as a footnote, that this is something important for lawyers to consider. It's not just that lawyers, you know, have these unexpected events. You know, they should be planning based on their, their um, obligations to clients for, as you, you know, to your point, diminished capacity and, and the fact that their judgment might be compromised at some point in their career and they don't even recognize it. So I think it's, uh, that's an important point to consider here. Th thanks. Well, uh, this is Joel. Um, you know, based on the recent uh, back and forth on the uh, APRL website where this topic came up, um, it seemed to me that it broke down into two separate topics. There is what obligation do I have to ha have a succession plan uh, of some sort that anticipates what happens when I become incapacitated in any number of ways? as opposed to what regulation ought there to be of those attorneys, say, such as myself, who've now next week will have been admitted 50 years in practice. Do I have a sell-by date that needs to be regulated by a further uh, testing obligation? Um, some people have suggested a driver's test, a civility test, all kinds of things when you just become a cranky old lawyer. And so, <laughs> Those seem to me, though, to be two separate topics, and I think that the most we ought to do with this is just what should you have in place uh, in anticipation of the normal kinds of things that may come up, as opposed to what regulation there might be as to how do you weed out old cranky lawyers like me at a certain age or a certain event. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, Joel, you would be in favor of, of not adding a dimension or footnote even um, to address the, the more gradual situation where um, a lawyer's judgment is impaired so that would trigger succession planning obligations and just focus on kind of the current framework, which is about sort of unexpected um, incapacities. Is, is that a fair characterization or are you saying something else no no that's not fair uh not that you were being unfair but that uh i think that the possibility of dementia or diminished capacity even if it's not dementia just in terms of your uh, time available to attend to a practice that kind of thing if you reach a certain uh age or uh status in your career is something that is anticipated or it's possibly anticipated and could be considered. What I wanted to separate, separate out um, was any notion of some kind of outside uh, regulation, testing, examination to determine if maybe 
I'm suffering from dementia, uh, whether I have a plan in place or not, uh, you know, in my, you know, in case of emergency break glass file. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I don't think, um, uh, I, I, I would not um, be in favor of expanding to testing requirements or anything of that um, ilk in this opinion. So uh, I, you're, we're on the same page. I okay. didn't go that far. We already have our diminished capacity opinion that touches on some of those issues. I don't think that we would want to um, cross that over here. So um, I, I don't see that as um, becoming part of this opinion. Any other um, thoughts about, yeah, I see Raquel. I think I have a couple of points. Um, I feel like I do support the idea of referencing dementia because while it's gradual on the person, the implications do come suddenly, if, if that makes sense. In other words, you could be diagnosed 10 years ago, but all of a sudden in, in year, 14 or 15, it's here. So I do think the, the play out of dementia is in the context of something sudden, while it may be expected, but when it actually plays out, it, it can be very sudden. It's more, it's more likely that it's sudden than not. So I think having um, some language in there um, to, that it just is a marker in some way of something people can keep in their mind. I, um, my understanding is that a role is a mandate, meaning you have to do this behavior and a opinion is trying to be persuasive in changing behavior. Is that correct? Am I correct in how I'm separating? Um, I guess you know? that's one way to look at it. I, I don't think that's wrong. Um, I, I guess we'll, Tell me how you, what's the end in mind of an opinion? Well, there's, I think there's several and, and related to what you're saying, I think is it, it it's to provide a, a resource for lawyers to understand their ethical obligations, right? So here we're trying to help lawyers understand that there are important ethical implications to succession planning and that it's important to consider their succession planning in order to protect client interests, which is really basically another, um, I think the, the, a different side to the same point of what you're saying. So, okay. Um, so I, I mean, I, rel I relate to that. The reason I wanna clearify is because I have, if that's the framework, I'm gonna, then my comment is in that framework. And I, I do believe ultimately we want to check, we want them to have a succession plan, not just think about it. Um, and so when I read this opinion, it's it's persuasiveness is it it could be enhanced. <laughs> um, let me just say it that way. In other words, I think opinion's purpose is for change of behavior without moving all the way to mandating for a role. So it's you know, we're not doing it to say, just think about it, but actually this is pretty important. And so therefore we're using lots of ways and scenarios to perhaps impress upon them the importance, um, which I think is, you know, done well with the numer numerous examples. However, I do think, um, and I don't have anything particular to suggest, um, but I was left feeling, um, with everything else going on, particularly to the group that this probably most um, affects, it didn't light a fire. It probably doesn't light a fire of them of this is high on my list. Interesting, but not high on my list. Um, and it's and really that group, it should be high on the list because it probably has the greatest uh, implications if no action is taken. So those are my top line thoughts. 
so just to sort of reframe that last um, comment, um, it, it sounds to me like what, it, you would be in favor where where we're able to be more definitive, because you know we do have some limitations. We're not we're not creating a new rule, for instance, right? It's it's an ethics opinion, but where we can be more definitive um, about what we're saying is an ethical obligation or mandate. It sounds like you would be in favor of us looking at some of the word choices to make it more clear where we can, that this is important, this is required, things along those lines. Yes, if that could be persuasive. Another, something I'll offer, but it doesn't fit in the frame of way opinions are uh, currently drafted. Um, but this idea of there's, a number of rules that are referenced and use the rules in some way as a principles framework up front. And so that way you immediately tie why this is important to the attorney because it's in some way more based on these are the rules, sort of the rules are mixed in. Um, so I realize, as I said, no, that's not the frame that opinions are, are currently constructed over. Okay, well, no, that's helpful. I mean, um, you know, the reason we have these conversations is is because the <laughs> our opinions go through many iterations, and we consider the structure and content to be most of to try to make it as effective as possible for the reading audience. So it's it's always helpful to to hear these perspectives, partic particularly since um, um, Raquel and Dan, you you two have um, not. Uh, lived through uh, the the discussions in the past and are looking at this with a fresh set of eyes. So that's that's helpful feedback and and we'll try to look at it again with those with the sort of fresh lenses that you offer. So I appreciate that. Justin is Ken. Uh, I just want and on the question we got earlier about the or. Uh -huh. If memory serves me correct, I haven't looked in a while. There's a section on the state bar's website about closing a practice with some sample forms and things of that nature. And if I recall, it talked about situations where someone, either a conservator or an executor, and some other instances where you know a non-lawyer, you know, might have access to. Uh, information you know to close or transfer a practice when an attorney is disabled or or or, or passes away um, so if we haven't looked at that you know maybe take a peek at that because I, I i'm 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 pretty sure there was something in there dealing with that uh, situation where you can have a non-lawyer that's great that's really helpful i mean if that if we can find that and cite to the state bar forms. Yeah, it's guideline for closing practice or something yeah. to that effect. But yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Anything else? This is this has um, been very helpful. Justin, um, I just had one other comment, and it I thought of it as we were discussing this. Um, you know, whether to include the or here, which I agree with your inclination to remove it. But initially when I was considering it, I was trying to figure out, are we talking about a, a lawyer with a solo practice or a larger practice? And I had to scroll up to the, the facts up above to confirm. And I, I think because we're talking, we have the general discussion of the rules first, and then we get into the application of the scenarios like we've done in other opinions, I think it might be useful to have the, the factual scenario be incorporated into the body. So it's clear what we're addressing because we have a, a long discussion of the rules first. And I, I don't know, I, I can't always keep track and it's not have to go back. So I think it's just simpler for the reader to have it all in one place. Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Cause this is in, in regards to scenario one, right? So, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Anything else?
Well, if not, um, thank you. Uh, the the working group uh, subcommittee, whatever we're supposed to be called, we'll we'll work on uh, refining this for the next um, meeting. Thanks, Justin. And I think we're kind of close. Well, what is your opinion, just um, so to kind of for planning purposes, when this might be ready for voting? Do you think it'll be ready at the next meeting? Well, I'll be frank with you. I have a trial that starts January okay. 3rd. So if it doesn't settle, um, it's not going <laughs> to have anything <laughs> January. If it does settle, then, um, you know, that that clears some time. So, OK, it's, that, you know, that's the world's years. worst trial date I've ever heard in my life. I know. Um, <laughs> It was it was probably intentional by the judge, but we'll leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> Got it. OK, so we'll play it by ear. Um, Thanks, Justin. <laughs> so I think the next item on the agenda is the lawyer as expert witness opinion, and I can um, start the discussion on that topic. Um, if you can share the I, I like to look at the red line version for discussion and it looks like um, Angela or Mimi have it up, I can't tell. Um, so the first change I wanted to mention, um, actually it, it's not really major, but page four around line 79 of the red line, I think. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm still trying to, okay. So this was, sorry, I think my version that I was looking at was slightly different. So I'm trying to, just pull up my version really quick so I can understand. Okay, so I think, um, sorry about this. I I think what was crossed out here, it's, it's not showing in red line, but in my version, we were talking about the potential application of rule 1.4 to scenario one, which scenario one is the lawyer first, then testifying expert. Um, and so there was a question initially here, what, whether we should consider the application and um, my recommendation is that it, it wouldn't apply to this particular situation where the lawyer is representing, um, where he, here the lawyer is, law firm's attorney-client relationship has been concluded. So the duty of communication wouldn't apply to the law firm and the duty of communication wouldn't apply to the testifying expert uh, who's limiting the expert's role to a testifying expert. So I didn't think we needed to discuss rule 1.4 in connection with this scenario one. Um, and I think the ultimate, it, this was just a question that was appearing in the initial draft, whether we should consider it. So I did not address it here. Um, I'll pause to see if anyone feels that we should discuss rule 1.4 in connection with this scenario one. Okay, so I think the next change that I wanted to talk about, um, and actually before we get there, I did notice a typo, at least in the draft I was looking at. I know we can address that later, but since we're just going through it, if you could go to page page nine, line 259. Uh, yeah, that I don't know, that shouldn't have been changed. I'm not sure it, it should be might, <laughs> but I think somehow something just happened there. Um, but the next substantive change, um, if you could, could go to page, also on page nine lines. So a lot of these were just clarifying edits uh, around 261 um, through line 264, really just to clarify that the factual situation. Um, and then we added um, some sentences starting at line 270 forward. Um, and this was based on our last meeting. Um, and this was to address a situation 
um, the potential application of Rule 1.7b regarding material limitation conflicts. Um, and so this was intended to address a situation where the law firms might be material limited based on the expert's engagement as an expert or the lawyer's business, professional, personal relationships with that expert. And if that would somehow limit the law firm's representation of the client. Um, and this is a, with scenario three, which is the concurrent testifying expert and, and law firm in separate and unrelated matters. It doesn't seem, I added this language for the uh, discussion at this meeting um, because it was part of the feedback we discussed previously, but in my mind, this seems like maybe it should be included in a footnote as opposed to the body. Um, I think this risk does not appear high um, given the facts and that they're they're unrelated and separate matters involving different parties. But I can't recall who raised this, this comment at the last meeting and, and if you prefer to keep it in the body as opposed to a footnote or we could work with the language as well. But um, I'm gonna pause again and see if others have feedback on whether we think this should be part of the body or part of a footnote um, or any other edits to this section. At least for me, a footnote's fine. Otherwise, not at all. I don't. I don't see a strong reason that it has to be in the body. So I share your view. Thanks, Justin. I think it should be, this is Brandon, I think it should be a footnote as well. I, I think that's a good idea. Okay. All right, that sounds good. And that, that's where I was leaning. Um, Cause I, I recognize it's a risk, but I, I just think it's a, a, a pretty small risk given the factual scenario. Um, and then the final um, kind of issue that was based on our discussion at the last meeting um, is also dealing with the same scenario three where it's the concurrent testifying expert and law firm um, and the matters are separate and unrelated. And we were talking about the potential application of uh, both the duty of communication, Rule 1.4, and um, material limitation conflicts under 1.7b. And I think if you could scroll to page down further here. Um, okay, yeah, this is a, a line 297. If you see in the green highlighting, um, this was the summary of what the comments were at the last meeting, where um, Ken has suggested potentially the application of uh, Rule 1.4b. Um, which deals with, um, let me just pull up that rule again. It, it deals with consulting with the client um, or explaining a matter to the client to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions regarding the representation. Um, and then Justin had also suggested perhaps 1.4A3 might apply. Um, requiring that the lawyer can inform the client or keep the client reasonably informed about significant developments relating to the representation. Um, and I, I think in, res in response to some of the discussion, I, I also question whether um, 1.7b might potentially apply um, relating to the, the factual scenario that, that Ken had raised. And, and Ken's comment was, that because the expert is testifying against a current client of the firm, the expert's testimony could be given undue weight if the relationship were known to a jury, which would be detrimental to the law firm's client. Um, so I, I, I was analyzing this, I didn't make any edits and I, I welcome feedback from Ken, Justin or others if, if you feel like we, we should edit this to note the potential application of these rules. My conclusion after kind of evaluating um, was that the duty of communication applies to a lawyer's representation of a client. 
So I was initially having trouble understanding how it could apply here um, where there are separate matters involving separate parties. And um, I guess it's, I understand Ken's point, it would be the law firm's potential duty to communicate, but I, um, I'm just question how it would it let the client make an informed decision regarding the representation in this separate matter. Um, I, I had trouble kind of coming up with a, a scenario where it, it seems, you know, if you want to articulate, Ken, about what you think the law firm should tell the client and, and how it relates to 1.4b. Oh, yeah. yeah, I would just kind of put myself in the shoes of the client. I mean, if as a client, you know, I'm, you know, you have various expectations of loyalty and all that. And, uh, you know, and, you know, if I were to know, you know, that uh, a attorney member of the firm is testifying against me in an unrelated matter, I mean, that could bear upon my decision whether I want to have that firm represent me or, or you know, issues of that nature that 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 was the only thing that was popping in my brain in terms of you know whether the firm might have some obligation to communicate that back to their client you know if i was the client in that circumstance and i found out you know from some other source you know somebody calls me you know, hey do you know a lawyer from your firm is testifying against you in this case so, you know you know you know I would, that's the kind of thing I would think my lawyer should have told me as opposed to learning from someone else. So. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, and I'm just, the other issue that I'm, I'm wondering, and Justin raised, uh, Justin, maybe I don't know if you had it, if that was what you had in mind too. You, you both suggested different subsections of the rule. B is talking about keeping the client, um, B is talking about, telling the client about information that is necessary for the client to make informed decisions regarding the representation. And then A3 is keeping the client reasonably informed about significant developments um, relating to the representation. In my mind, it seems like B might uh, apply more to that type of factual scenario as opposed to, I don't know if I would consider this to be a significant development, but relating to the representation because um, it's concerning a, a different representation, but I guess it could potentially impact the client's decision about the representation because of the loyalty issues that, that Ken raised. So what, what are others' thoughts about, should we reference one or both of these subsections? I guess I'm having, uh, sorry, I'm um, late to the issue, but I am having a little bit of discomfort with the loyalty violation. And I know that we have a strong technical reading that, you know, 1.7 doesn't apply because you're not um, representing a client adverse to your client. I just, uh, I think I need to satisfy myself a little further that the duty of loyalty permits um, a member of a law firm to take action adverse to a client of a law firm even if it's just not, if it's not representation. And I know that's not the most helpful comment because it's not super grounded in further research in case law, but I'm having a little bit of discomfort on that front that I need to chase down. Yeah, and um, Brandon, I understand. I know Adam um, Koss uh, worked on this opinion a lot, um, a prior member of our, our committee, and he had, he had a similar <laughs> concern. Um, so I, I understand. Um, well, do we get into some kind of like uh, an Oasis West? Do we look to that for some kind of guidance? Because in that case, it wasn't an expert uh, activity adverse to the client, but it was what what civic activity yeah. adverse to the client, and there was some language in that case about it did implicate the duty of loyalty, if I recall. So but Joel- Since I've read the case. So are, is that where we wanna look? Joel, that, that the Oasis West case is what I was thinking entirely. But if I recall that the difference there is it was the guy's civic uh, activities 
were with respect to the very same subject matter, the same development that the law firm had represented the client on. So it ties in more directly. But I feel like this duty of loyalty as expressed there, even if the facts don't align, I'm not 100% confident that we don't still have a duty of loyalty. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge for yeah. me. If you look at the, I think there's a, this is Cassidy. Um, if you look at the comment to rule 1.9, it cites Oasis West and, and the, I don't have it in front of me, but the duty of loyalty quote is like, you can't do anything to prejudice the former client. Um, so it seems broad, but I haven't, I haven't read Oasis read West recently. So, uh, I, but I, I agree. I think it would have may apply. <laughs> so Cassidy, I think that my, my uncertainty with that is my gut tells me exact that you, I would never do this. I would not, I would, right. I would object to anyone in my law, but trying to, um, key it to a prohibition the comment to 1.9 says you will never do anything to injure your client with respect to a matter that you formerly represented that client, right. which is very clear and wouldn't apply here. It just seems like, um, yeah. And I also just wanted to clarify here that in this situation, I think we're talking about the application of 1.7 because this is, remember, this is concurrent expert. Right. right. So, so, so that's why I, I also flagged, which the only you know, subsection that I thought could potentially apply is 1.7b, which talks about, um, and I was trying to, I think this is, might have been just what Justin had articulated at the last meeting about kind of concerns about whether somehow the, the representation, the law firm's representation could be impacted based on the, the lawyer's um, relationship with the expert, with the lawyer serving as an expert, or kind of the financial benefits of that expert witness engagement, um, if that could somehow materially limit the law firm's representation and and implicate implicate Rule One Point Seven B, but it doesn't seem like the other the other su rule subsections don't appear to really address the loyalty issues that we're we're really talking about here. Right. I, I feel like, so the 1.9 and Oasis West stand for this kind of, you know, um, anomalous situation where you have like a residual duty of loyalty after the end of the attorney-client relationship, which means that during the attorney-client relationship, to me, the duty of loyalty is far more robust than whatever survives and is talked about in Oasis West. And, but I'm not sure it's so robust that it would arise under 1.7b but certainly if i were giving anyone advice on this i would tell them i'm concerned about 1.7b i'm just not sure we're ever going to find a case or anything on it but um but i see a 1.7b issue which is what triggers all the communication issues under 1.4 but i just need to I, i'm just wrestling with it a lot on that point well, I, I, Brandon, I don't think it's a, it's a far stretch from Oasis West to address the situation where the lawyer, it's a, a completely separate matter. You know, if right. they were Oasis West and it, he didn't, wasn't involved in the, the entitlement phase of that project and the firm wasn't involved. I, I just don't think that's a too far stretch to say, even if it's unrelated. I mean, I, I was retained as an expert in a case where the opposing expert was a former client of mine. And I, that, completely different case I represented the guy in, but, you know, I could impeach him, it, you know, that would obviously breach my duty of confidentiality and I wouldn't do that, but that's a scenario where there's a completely different representation, but it still could, you know, limit or impact this former client's testimony and credibility as a witness for this other party. I mean, I can see a situation where the court could easily apply Oasis West to that scenario and, and right. create a, a loyalty issue. Share if I could comment. Sure. Okay. So I I had my hand up because I wanted to ask Brandon to just share more, which he has. And um I I feel persuaded by Brandon and others who have spoken that this 
seems to this area and i don't know brandon if i was if if i would be able to say could you just even share more i realize you're sharing a little bit more each time but maybe like put it put it on the table because it's I'm, I'm somewhat persuaded um between maybe it's not a rule but it's common sense in some way if, you know if everybody says i would never do it but we can't find the case law to do it is that a reason not to stretch to say we shouldn't do it right but sometimes what you know what 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 is the intent of a role um not the letter of the law but the intent of the thing um so right. sort of a, a the side comment is i listened to several people who have said i'm not a role but i i never would do it um so i'm just wondering you know brandon if you could Maybe I wish I had prepared by rereading Oasis <laughs> West, but the gist and don't I don't worry, I haven't read it. So I, I don't well, know. I think <laughs> uh, Bill Munoz might have more uh, clarity on the facts. But my recollection is the firm represented a client in entitling a real estate project so that something could be built. And th the attorney at issue in the case didn't work on that project, but lived in a neighborhood that would be impacted and went around getting signatures against the client's project, right? And, and I think the relationship had ended, the attorney-client relationship, but they had previously worked on the project, the firm had. And so he felt he was free to go get these signatures as a citizen who would be impacted by whatever they were building and, and speak out in opposition to it. Um, and the court in that case found that he violated a continuing residual duty of loyalty to his client by even acting in this civic role. And I think what we're wrestling with here is in the hypothetical here, the subject matters are totally different, but it's a concurrent. The, the attorney-client relationship hasn't ended. So can a lawyer in the firm take action adverse to a client in the firm so long as it is not lawyer action? He's not representing somebody against the firm's client, but he, he or she would be testifying as an expert against the firm's client while the firm still represents the client. And I'm not aware of any case law or rule specifically explaining what the prohibitions would be under those circumstances. I think we're all just talking about how it makes us somewhat uncomfortable because attorneys have a duty of loyalty to their clients, which generally goes beyond just the specific subject matter. And the rules prohibit an attorney from representing someone in a different case adverse to their client, um, even in a different in, even in a different matter. While you still represent the client without, is that actually I have to look back at the rule if that's strictly prohibited, but it's implicated by these loyalty duties. So where does this hypothetical fit on that spectrum is, is tough to figure out. And if I inartfully described my dilemma, I, I ask anyone else to pitch in and explain it better. Well, you described the facts of Oasis uh, West pretty, pretty, pretty good there. Uh, okay. The, the relationship had ended by the time he he went and was gathering the signatures uh, on okay. that project. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I thought it was actually the in Oasis. It was the lawyer who did the legal work on behalf of the client, then took a public position opposite to the work the lawyer had done. Right. That's right. You, that's you may right. be right. I, I don't remember that precisely, and that's a big difference. That's an important yeah. difference. So. But once again, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you, Brian. I mean, that was the former client situation. Right. Like I said, when I was getting back to the communication issue, yeah, I, once again, I put myself in the shoes of the client. I'd want to know, you know, if, if the law firm I'm paying money to is doing things that could damage me in another matter. Well, let, let me just weigh in upon the frustration that was just shared. And I, I can recall to some of our uh, drafting in other areas where the criticism of the drafting committee is, well, where's your case law? Where's your authority? And although maybe there isn't a case, I, I'm not sure we want to shy away from it because if our gut was telling us that Oasis West was coming down the road in the future, but it hadn't arrived yet in terms of being a reported case, 
but it was an ethical concern. I don't know that we want to shy away from it just because we can't find a case directly in point. So I'm just weighing in on that general frustration that um, I don't want to just say we shouldn't opine or have opinions address potential ethical situations um, and decline to do something about it just because we can't find a case directly in point. And this is Dan, I, I agree with that in this in the sense that if 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 this situation came up and somebody in my firm did that, I would be very concerned and the clients would be outraged, I'm sure, to Ken's point. We always look at conflicts from the perspective of whether if the client find out found out later from somebody else, as Ken said, you know, would they be furious? And of course, that's a good rule of thumb, but I don't think we should uh, discount the practical here. If nobody here would do it and everybody thinks it's a colossally stupid idea, then why can't we just say that even if it isn't a technical violation? Other than making money, what's the justification for it? Why don't we That's just put that in the opinion say it's colossally stupid? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you're not going to, if you do that, you're not going to have either client problem for very long, in my opinion, probably. But, well, th that raises yeah. the further question is colossal stupidity an ethical violation? <laughs> it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not. but it, it should be, it should be mentioned. Right. Yeah. Uh, like, I feel like we, we try to avoid doing the practical advice in opinions, but sometimes we do. And we, I mean, this is one where we, we could consider it, but um, I, you know, I'm still, as we were talking about all these issues, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm coming back to, I was just thinking of, I know we discussed initially this, the initial version of this draft opinion um, had a longer discussion of the American Airlines case. And I also think that case is something we could, we should, reevaluate particularly in connection with this scenario um which was also a a former client situation where so arguably it's even stronger here where we're talking about current clients but that that was a situation where um the lawyer was serving as a pmk witness against a former client and that we we distinguished that particular case based on the because the findings in that case are based on the lawyer's fiduciary duties that a, that a PMK witness has. Um, although, uh, I don't know, I, I think that some of the analysis in American Airlines applies here and we might be able to, I don't know, flat is the case I always think about when we're talking about duty of loyalty to current clients and there might be some language there that could be useful um, if I go back and look at it closely, I'm just, yeah, so I, I think maybe the next step would be, I think this is the section of the draft opinion that warrants further consideration. So, so I think the, the working committee and if, if others have thoughts too, but I, I think we should kind of work on if there's a way we can apply some case law or, or the rules to this scenario. Um, and I, I'm also questioning, you know, here, is there any, should, should we be thinking about rule 1.10 imputation here in any way? Um, we discussed it in connection with the prior scenario, but I, I don't think we discussed it. Actually, that's a great point because we have a, a active representation and I wouldn't see any reason why the duty of loyalty isn't imputed to everybody at the firm. We might be worth mentioning, right? Yeah. Whatever we end up deciding the duty of loyalty permits or prohibits, it seems that it will be applicable to all the lawyers. Yeah, I mean, think about that. The, the law firm who's representing the client is presumably going to have confidential in information on their document management system that the expert who's quote unquote adverse 
to the um, that client in the other case would theoretically have access to that might be harmful to, if known to the expert or useful for the expert in the other case, unless that expert is not able to access that information. So there, there seem to be some issues there worth considering if we go down this rabbit hole. Okay, so did, I think I, I've gone over all of the kind of major changes or issues I wanted to discuss um, relating to this opinion, but did anyone else have comments to the revised draft opinion? Either on this section or others? Okay, so I really welcome the working groups kind of suggestions for, for this last section, because I really think that's what we'll focus on for the next meeting it is revising this highlighted area, um, because it seems like many of us are uncomfortable with the conclusion um, reached or, or not addressing the potential application at least of 1.7 and 1.4. So I think we should uh, evaluate it more and um, it, it might require some more research. So. That's what we'll work on for the next next meeting. Um, and we're actually ahead of schedule. Um, sure, before you move on, can you just sure. confirm the case law is Oasis West American Airlines and the last one you mentioned was? Flat. F-A-L-A-T, like flat? W two T's. Two T's. Yeah. Two T's, okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I think maybe we should see if we can do one more um, opinion since we have about 15 minutes. I don't know, I guess we could start on it or maybe break for lunch a little later um, at 12, 15 instead of noon if, it, if we need more time. The next one is the on the agenda is the ethics and in-house counsel opinion. Um, Cassidy, what do you think in terms of timing? Do you think that will be about a half hour? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's not really ready to go through it with a fine tooth comb or even kind of go through um, particular discussions in it. Um, still, we're kind of still high level because really what I did this time around, I went back and looked at the first, um, the 1.9 uh, section um, and reworked it a bit. And then I, you know, inevitably I had additional questions <laughs> that I was grappling with so I'm a little now I'm 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 somewhat more not I mean not more but I'm I um I, I kind of want to shift focus to that section um more than the section on um the stock um options and 1.8.1 and 1.7 um so I think, I mean, I think, I don't think we can, we should have a long discussion on it. I think I just kind of want to say I'm still working on it. Um, if, has anybody had a chance to look at the red lines of the first section um, at all? Because what I, what I did was I broke it out um, to, 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 to um, match the, um, the ABA opinion um, that that talks about this issue, and then when I was looking at the ABA opinion more closely, I thought this is not a very good opinion. <laughs> it's just so so um, perfunctory. It, there's no real analysis, and then it's also um, it was part of it was actually re um, uh, there was an a, an ABA opinion that had to do with the material adversity or material adverseness. Um, let me see. I don't have the. If, I, they're cited in there. It's like ninety-seven, whatever. Um, so it was it was amended basically. So I, I'm I'm kind of working on um, the flow based on the old ABA opinion, but then you know with, with the new revisions from the subsequent ABA opinion on the on the material adversity or material adverseness section. Um, I also revised the the facts um, because 
the way I wanted to, I wanted to be more clear or I mean, kind of an easier analysis because um, I didn't want the lawyer from old company to be um, involved at all in any of like the tech or patent issues. So I made lawyer a, you know, part of the team in the labor employment group of old company who's moving over to be general counsel of new company where, you know, the, that where the lawyer is head of the entire very small legal department, you know, so that um, there's no, so you can kind of see the, I guess the line um, between types of matters, you know, um, but anyway, I, so um, I was kind of playing with the facts there um, and then just kind of high level, the, what, it, what I'm struggling with is that, you know, when in-house lawyers move from one company to the next, they're not, you know, they're, it's, they're, we're talking about two employments, not two matters. So you're not, you can't really identify you know, whether something is the same or substantially related between the two employments, because they wear so many different hats at both companies. So I think the 1.9 analysis is hard in this context. And so that's kind of maybe what I wanted to talk about is, is how do you define a matter <laughs> in uh, when you're, when you're talking about in-house counsel employment. And I think that's sort of a common theme throughout this whole opinion because, you know, it's the it's the tension between the employee-employer relationship and the attorney-client relationship and how there's a, you know, some conflicts here, not conflicts in the in the ethical sense, but you know, there they they there's tension between those two concepts. So that's kind of what I've been thinking about. I know I'm a little bit all over the map here, um, but I'll pause here and see if anybody has any comments. I, you know, I have one well, on that page we're at right now, we're under question one. The, the paragraph that follows it didn't seem to follow the question. So if you scroll back up to the where question one is, it's talking about lawyer, wants to analyze potential conflicts relating to work at the old company and what makes that maybe ethical screen. And then the language that follows deals with the stock option that the attorney gets at the new. Oh, that is weird. Wait, yes, scroll. Yeah, I don't know whether that was just formatting when you're moving things around, but that, that didn't seem to follow with the question. Yeah, let me, can you scroll down? I don't, I, you're right, well, that is weird. Yeah, just kind oh, of. Oh, something happened. I don't know what happened. It's out of context. I don't think it used to be like that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, wait. I don't think. Ugh. Okay. So, but I the think. The vesting in the stock options at the new company doesn't have anything to do with the old company. No, I know. But I. Hold on. Let me look at my. It's hard to. Do I have my version in front of me? Okay. Um, oh, no, I think I think what you're looking at is, is just the facts because that's, um, we, we interpose the questions in between the facts. Uh, so after, So question I, I one. Just, I just yeah. found it confusing. I, I, I kind of thought that's what you're doing, but it just, you know, we have a question, you know, I just found it a little bit confusing because, you know, where we have the facts above, then we have a question and then sure. the facts that follow have nothing to do with the question. And then it goes into another question. So that was yeah, it. no, I, okay. But yeah, so I think, I mean, that's, that's what, it, you know, question one follows the, you know, the, the facts start and then question, there's a question about it and then the facts start up again and then there's a question about it and so on. So, Okay, that makes sense. We can we can maybe just put the questions all in one place and the facts above it. Um, so, 
yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, I want to rework. Oh, and there, and there was another question. There was another kind of wrinkle too under 1.9 C, which is you are required, even if a 1.9 conflict doesn't um, exist under A or B, C still applies to prohibit the lawyer from disclosing confidential information unless it's generally known. And so that's kind of, you know, okay, well, what's generally known mean? Um, can the lawyer use, you know, his know-how, his or her know-how from that that they got from the old company and brought it to, you know, bringing it to the new company? What what is what is that? Um, so, and I and I think it's an important point because of the way you know this type of mobility works is that you're an in-house lawyer who. Um, you know, is moving from one company to the next, and you're and you are being hired because of your history at you know old company or your you know what you've learned and your skills and all of that. So, is that generally known? You know, I know that's like work product, but there's I think there's a gray area there. And I came across a really good um, article by John v Villa Williams and Connolly about this issue. So I kind of want to flesh that out. Although there's you know, his article was about the model rules and, you know, it doesn't really talk about California and a comment in 1.9 um, says that generally known does not mean, you know, publicly available information. So it will have to be kind of tailored to our strict confidentiality rule um, and what that means here. So I, I, I kind of think that's important because you know, an in-house lawyer would read that and go, well, what can I say, what can I use from what I learned at my old company to represent my new company, you know, so that needs to be fleshed out. And then um, I did, I did add a section on screening, um, but I, my, I think what I'm going to do about the screening is that the duty to screen may only um, arise if there's a you know a conf a conflict that ar arises later on. I, I don't see a conflict based on the fact a 1.9 conflict based on the facts that we um, have here. But it's possible that you know, for example, old company new company could um, you know file competing patents and there or and there could be a patent case between them. You know. And that that may trigger a duty to screen um, lawyer um, if they're if to the extent lawyer you know ha, is involved in well I I, I I'm not sure because if lawyer was only part of the labor and employment group of the old company and is now general counsel of new company um, and new company wants to sue old company for patent infringement or vice versa. And lawyer is is um, going to be handling, say, you know, outside counsel and all of that. Does that does that create a conflict? You know, does that is that a conflict under one point nine? Um, I mean, can lawyer handle that? You know. So even though lawyer was not even has no confidential information about old companies' patents and and technology because he was in the labor and employment group and um and was not you know substantially involved in any of their you know patent issues um and handling them you know did not personally represent old company in any sort of tech or patent you know applications or anything like that so uh, cassidy yeah there's, there's a case maybe 25 30 years ago called Maritrans versus Pepper Hamilton and Sheets, Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And the case was a uh, law firm handles labor negotiations for a shipping company uh, and very successfully, and they have whole ideas about how to negotiate the company's labor contracts with the unions. Um, and Pepper Hamilton then hires this attorney away from that law firm and uh, goes to work representing a competitor of the prior law firm on labor negotiations for a competitor shipping company. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't recall all the facts, but the outcome of the case was that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court issued an injunction requiring the second firm to fire the competitor client and not work on the matter. And just all I'm saying is take a look at that because it might have some instruction or guidance. And I know there's some cases that have cited the Ameritrans case recently, but it might give you some uh, a trail to pick up on and curiosity on that issue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I know there's a, there, you know, I know that there are a lot of cases out there about um, the competing patent, you know, the competing patents issue and um, were they both, were they in-house, was it an in-house lawyer or was it just counsel? Oh, this was two private law firms. The, right. the, the lawyer switched from one law firm to the other. Right. But it had to do with the knowledge that they took from the attorney-client relationship in the first situation to the second. Okay. And it's competitive disadvantage to the first. Right. And it was used for the second. So uh, not on all fours, but it might, that's why I say it might just give you some, a trail to pick up on. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's organizing all of these kind of disparate concepts disparate or seemingly disparate concepts into something that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, yeah, the whole like playbook, you know, if you know that, the, you know, the whole um, knowledge of the company's playbook, is that part of, you know, the, is that enough to create, you know, a, a, a breach of duty of, um, duty of loyalty? Um, okay. So that's where I'm at on this one. Um, and so if that, you know, I'm just gonna keep working on it. If anybody else wants to join the the drafting team, um, our subcommittee, I would love it because Kyla is gone. Um, so that's it. Unless you guys have any more to talk about or questions. Cassidy, I have a question and a comment. Sure. Um, when you started speaking, this is going to be a question. When you started speaking, you said several areas that you were going to, you wanted to now relook and can you just restate them? Cause I wanted to note them as I'm looking at it again. Sure. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I was not as clear. So the first, the first question having to do with, um, the conflicts arising from the movement from old company to company mm -hmm. um that has to do with former client conflicts and the and the rule 1.9 analysis um so i want it, to it just needs to be well i've broken it up i think it, you know um the the issues i've broken down the issues a little bit better it just needs to be fleshed out more because then there are some kind of sub issues within each of those um, topics that, that, that need to be addressed, which I kind of touched on. Um, so that's, that's what I meant. Okay. I thought you said some other things like stock and you, you so that's, yeah. So then the second you won or I'm sorry, I thought it was different than Q1. It is. So, okay. Yeah. So the second question has to do with once lawyer is at company, um, their, the, the lawyer's comp schedule or comp arrangement, um, where stock is being offered or stock options are being offered. Does that create a conflict in and of itself? So uh, like a personal interest conflict or a conflict under 1.8.1, um, or a material limitation conflict under 1.7, or does it trigger the requirements under 1.8.1, which is a business transaction pecuniary interest adverse to a client. So it has nothing to do with old complex with old company now. Now we're talking about, okay, well, client or uh, lawyers own complex with with their own client, with, uh, with company. Okay. Um, comment is, it seems from a business perspective, very onerous, some very onerous sort of non-practical standards for attorneys in other words it really seems like it it stifles an attorney's livelihood yeah well that's the whole point I mean, here. 
when you yeah. consider just any other professional, like you move, like you, and yeah. you, you have knowledge, that's why you move. Um, and so the idea, I, I feel like as I'm reading and have heard the conversation from last time and this time, as you speak and then read, it doesn't, it, it just seems overly, overly onerous. And right. almost like you're locked, once you're somewhere, you're locked in because it's a false sense that you're going to go somewhere else and in and, and some way leave half your brain on the table. Like, it's, yeah, you know, now certainly you cannot be assigned to certain things and that, that um, is possible. You know, when you get to a farm, if you know there's some conflict or you have some information, but after a while, uh, when you've been practicing that ends up being a greater and greater things that you can't be involved in and then what is your real value so I I just think it's in some way it's a pie in the sky but when you go into the practice of work doesn't seem like it really is beneficial on either side of the table for the employer or the employed yeah I mean that's that's kind of the the overarching struggle here is that the rules apply to in-house lawyers to the same same extent they apply to all other lawyers. But what you're talking about here is is where you know where the rules may become unfair um, when in in when they're being applied to in-house lawyers because of that practicality because you know they they're they're not working for a law firm they're working for you know their own clients and they have such a breadth of duties. And thus learn so much and take, you know, that, that, yeah, they take with them when they go to another company, which, you know, naturally they want to go to a company similar to their old one, typically, because that's what they know, <laughs> you know, so, um, so it's, it, that's the struggle. And so the goal is to find the practical, solu not solution, but practical analysis, because otherwise they are, they are, um, held to the same standard, you know, they're held to the rules. And so what does that mean in this context is what we're trying to kind of figure out um, or what I'm trying to figure out. And to that end, I, I, um, I did reach out to um, the San Francisco bar um, in-house committee. Um, they're having a conference coming up and I, I, I got the email and I thought, oh, I'm just, gonna, maybe I'll just reach out to the chair of that committee just to, to see if I can get some, um, insight from them. And so I'm waiting to hear back from uh, the co-chair. Um, so it's a group of like, you know, eight in-house lawyers. So I think that might be a good resource. That's it. Anything else? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, actually, Raquel's comment just made me think of um, whether I don't know if it addresses um, in-house counsel situation, but the, the treatise that, uh, I guess it's Hillman and Allison Rhodes on lawyer mobility. I wonder if that um, has something um, like an in-house counsel section that might be a good resource. Um, although it might be focused more on law firm issues, but um, I did really like how you revise the facts because I think it will make it easier <laughs> yeah. to analyze a lot of the situations and the questions you raised about what is a matter where the lawyers prior work was focused on labor and employment. And, and I think your questions about the application of um, rule 1.9, we might need to, and maybe it's already in here and I missed it, just add more facts about what confidential information the lawyer acquired right. at, the, at, at the old company. Um, but I really, I thought the revisions you made were very helpful, so. Um, I know Cap Cassidy did ask if anyone does want to join this this working group because um, we did recently lose one of the members of the working uh, group so that there is room if anyone else um, wants to join uh, feel free to uh, let us know now or, or email staff later. I'll join. Okay, thanks Raquel. Thanks Raquel. Be helpful. Um, so it doesn't, does anyone else have any, Cassidy, were you done with your? Yeah, <laughs> I'll just keep working on it. Thank you guys. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I, I think you've made great progress. Um, and well, it's, I, you know, it's, it's hard. <laughs> but um, I now that we're uh, right around lunchtime, um, I think maybe we should break and return at 12.07 now. So maybe come back at 1.10. 1, Does that work for everyone? Yes. Right. Perfect. All right. Thanks. I'll see you back in a little bit. Thank you. Okay. And I think the next item on our agenda um, for this afternoon is the discussion of the flat fee draft ethics opinion. Ken, did you want to take the lead on discussing that, the edits to that opinion? Not really. No, I'm just <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, what happened since last time, I, I tried to, I took heed of the comments, so I tried to cut down on some of the perhaps extraneous stuff, rearranged and cleaned it up a little bit. Um, substantively, the other than those edit formatting and moving around there is substantively the one area I was touching more upon in this draft is located on uh, page eight, starting at line 295. And this is kind of touching on uh, you know, the issue I struggled a bit with before is you know, the extent of disclosures and what you have to put you know, in terms of uh, in your fee agreement of how the flat fee is gonna work. Um, what I added here, which I, I thought might be somewhat controversial, but then Joel corrected me and said that he just given his expert witness opinion on this. So, um, is how the uh, provisions of business pressure code 6148 tie, which have the, you know, the requirements for written fee agreement and the billings can tie into that. So such that in the flat fee scenario, the, the, the kind of the position I take here is when you read those sections uh, in conjunction with uh, the other flat fee requirements, uh, that uh, you know a fee agreement for a flat fee, unless it's just a single service, you know I'm going to draft this contract or whatever. Probably you know may need to require you know terms in there, milestones or whatever, how when the fees will be earned. So I added that and opened that part up for discussion. Other than that. Uh, I said I uh, did some modification on, or some uh, that's on page eleven, where I'm changing a little bit more on the uh, the midstream modification issue. I, I clean that up a little bit. Um, build out the analysis on the scenarios a bit more, although they still need some work on that. One issue that I'm still kind of working on, and it kind of comes in, I, I, I touch on it more on page six, around line 206. Uh, is the concept, you know, whose property is the advance? fee payment in a flat fee scenario. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I went back on an earlier version and looked at all the, uh, the public comments on the rules revisions relating to the flat fees and you know, the arguments uh, that seem to have prevailed that you don't necessarily have to put it into your trust account for people to do flat fee work is that you know, they provide a consumer service and, and you know, basically of necessity, they need to have access to the funds that are paid in advance, even if they hadn't necessarily performed the services. 
Uh, and I've kind of struggled with that because, you know, implicit in putting it in the operating account instead of a trust account is that it's the lawyer's property. Because if it's not the lawyer's property, it shouldn't go into the operating account. But the lawyer still has the ongoing duties to return it. So I, I'm still struggling with that concept a little bit. Um, I did not have a chance to get together with Joel and Brandon uh, to, to work on, on these, but with those tweaks and some reformatting, I invite any and all comments that people might wish to make. So. Yeah, Ken, um, <clears throat> you know, in further reflection on the real life experience, which I just well, I'm still living through it because I haven't testified at trial yet. But uh, in that case, uh, a client had invested about $3 million in fees getting the case ready for trial. Uh, we're two weeks before trial. The client is really getting concerned about the fees and in discussing a potential offer to settle. Uh, the ongoing problem with the fees come up. And it was agreed then that the attorney would complete any trial preparation and try the case coming up in two weeks hence uh, for a $600,000 flat fee on top of the 3 million or so the client had already paid. Uh, two days later, uh, it, it turns out that the attorney allegedly has uh, committed malpractice by failing to properly designate an expert, but that's not the point. But the client then said, I've lost, you know, confidence in you. I'm going with another lawyer. So now you've got the $600,000 fee, which the attorney had deposited in the um, general operating account. And the question became then, all right, there was only two weeks worth of trial preparation of a case that had already been prepared to the tune of $3 million versus the task of the trial, which obviously is a whole new task, et cetera. And in absence of any guidance or anything in the contract, uh, rightly or wrongly, I opine that you also have to consult or consider the reasonable expectation of the client. And it was my view that the reasonable expectation of the client, malpractice aside, was that the remaining trial prep would be virtually minimal and the trial work would be the vast bulk of the $600,000. And the attorney's position was, well, I've, um, I'm ready and willing to, to um, try the case, but you fired me, so I couldn't. I'm keeping the whole 600000 That was wrong because the um, right of the client to fire the client, uh, the attorney at any time is absolute. It's not a breach of contract. And so that doesn't excuse the performance of the service. But then you get into the issue, well, how do you allocate the 600000 Mm -hmm. And my view was that the reasonable expectation of the client was in the nature of $50,000 for remaining trial prep and $550,000 to try the case. Um, I went on to further opine that because of the malpractice, they're not even entitled to the 50, but that's another story. But the concept that I dealt with or struggled with was the reasonable expectation of the client in absence of any discussion in the fee agreement in compliance with 6148 has to be considered. Uh, and that's the way I came down on it. And I don't know if we want to give some further thought to using reasonable expectation of the client as a guidepost in the allocation process. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's interesting. I had not considered including reasonable expectation of the client. Um, yeah, I think it's worth, worth further discussion. Yeah. I mean, the point, yeah. And then where I was getting at with the 6148 is, 
I mean, you, you're supposed to set forth the scope of the work and your billings are supposed to how it could be paid. So if you haven't covered any of that in your fee agreement with a flat fee, you know, how is that compliant with 6148? You know, the, you know, the point I was trying to make there is that may require that you include, you know, milestones or some of the language, otherwise it's a non-compliant fee agreement. So. Well, I kind of backed into that yeah, yeah. because there was no articulation of what went to what task in the fee agreement. Then you got a non-complying fee agreement. It's not clear. Uh, I can't remember the exact words of 6148, but it's not clear of how the fee is going to be calculated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're stuck with a reasonable value. And even if you assume that $600,000 was a reasonable value to finish the preparation and try the case, um, it's the reasonable expectation of the clients that weighs in on reasonable value. Hmm. So, so somewhat related to those concepts, and I'm not advocating this position, but I've heard it talked about, and I've heard it talked about in these sort of um, uh, like in the Im immigration law arena and things where there's, you know, you pay $5,000 and I processed your application, whatever it is. And if there's a termination or, or, or a failure to perform, I've heard a lot of people tell me that they believe it's not a quantum merit analysis situation. If you don't perform the services, you don't get paid. And that's what the nature of those sort of flat fee agreements are. If you, if you, you know, you can't take it to the 90 yard line, say, I'm going to withdraw, but you, you owe me 90% of the money or whatever. Um, and I, I'm, I haven't, heard uh you know ethical rule support for that position but i did find it kind of intriguing and just want to throw it out there and i'm sorry ken that i wasn't able to to talk with you before i got sick before the holiday and such but um but you know something for us to kick around on this is whether we analyze that point of view and what we think of it the well, idea that the aren't you there if you start with the proposition that your flat fee isn't earned until you complete the task. But right, but yeah, and the idea is doing half the work doesn't give you a quantum merit entitlement of half the flat fee. It's that that the agreement's different than that. Are you talking about a situation where the attorney withdraws or the client terminates the lawyer? Well, so what I keep hearing yeah, about in the it is different, but what I keep hearing about in the immigration law context is that it's always really ambiguous because the uh, government takes years to process things. Clients are, you know, often think the attorney's not doing what he or she promised to get things moving. And mm -hmm. there's always a dispute as to who is dropping the ball or why the work isn't getting done. But what I have heard is a lot of people that think that if you don't complete the task, you don't get any of the fee. And that might be just wrong, but I just wanted to throw it out there first. Oh, well, okay. But no, then I, I think that is just wrong. It's the same thing as a contingent fee case. In other mm -hmm. words, if you, you get 90% of the way and the client fires you, mm -hmm. uh, or even if you withdraw for cause, um, you have provided value to the client. And in your, your, your um, uh, immigration application situation, uh, attorney A prepares all the paperwork and all attorney B has to do is, is walk down to the immigration office and file it. Right. Review it for 10 minutes and then file it. Uh, there's reasonable value has been provided. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, you're looking at the analogy to the Cazares situation, uh, attorney one versus attorney two, even though that's a contingent fee, uh situation um uh, i think you get to the same result okay yeah if, I, I don't remember if i got, sent you guys is when i went back and i dug up all the commentary uh public comments regarding uh the rules revisions dealing with this um if memory shows me correct <laughs> there was a lot of input from immigration lawyers so <laughs> Maybe I'll, if, I, if I didn't send those to you, I'll send them to you and we can uh, take a look at them as we rehash this for the next draft. So. Hey, Joel, this is Bill. When you're, when you're talking about reasonable expectation of the client, are you basing that on contract principles? Or are you trying to find somewhere in the rules that say there's a 
reasonable expectation of the client that must be considered when, when talking about that? Because I, 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 if there's not something in the rules, I, I'd be a little leery to be to suggest that unless it's you know basic contract expectations. And if it's contract just based purely on contract law, then it should be the reasonable expectation of the parties, not simply the client. In my view, I, I, mean, I can be totally wrong, but it seemed like it would have to be both parties, not just one-sided. Well, in my case, the attorney took a completely unreasonable point of view by saying, I was ready, willing, and able to prepare uh, to do it, and you didn't let me, which is not proper because the client always has the unfair right to terminate. But uh, when you talk about reasonable value uh, for that $600,000 that I was talking about, I think you really do have to consider the reasonable, val reasonable expectations of the client, particularly in light of the fact that what's the client's um, uh, next step is to have to go out and hire somebody to finish the trial and pay them $600,000 or whatever the number is. And so certainly you've got to take that in consideration and in, in evaluating what's the reasonable value that the attorney provided up to the point of termination. And that's, that's just 6148B and all of our work on reasonable value factors in our uh, arbitration advisories. Even though we never, I don't think we ever considered an advisory before on flat fee, but when you get into, okay, reasonable value, you, you put in some work, you, could, you didn't complete it, the client's been benefited, then uh, how much has the client been benefited but also what benefits the client has to do with what the client was expecting to have done at the end of the day. And so um, it's just a factor. I don't think that's improper to include in the considerations that an arbitrator should think about if the arbitrator is called upon to make that allocation. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't do an advisor. I mean, I know, but yeah. I want to say back in like 2012 or 2013, we, you know, I, I pushed for it. We never got there. And so, and when I brought it up here, my initial thinking was an advisory, but the group, I think, was leaning more towards an ethics opinion. So that's kind of where we're at. So. Well, but still, yeah. um, I guess it's, you know, well, I had I had considered the attorney makes the representation that included with that $600,000 uh, the client gets a case tried and that's what the client's expecting I think that's something that weighs into whether the attorney has provided value to the client Did uh, anyone else have any thoughts or comments on the latest draft or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, Raquel. Uh, yeah, um, I think two questions and a comment. Okay. Um, one question I think relates to what Joel's example is of the $3 million. So Joel, are you saying that the $3 million is a sunk cost, meaning the client was not trying to recoup that. They felt that for whatever they thought they were gonna get for 3 million, that they were fine with that. It was just the 650. Yeah, well, absent, absent the malpractice that tainted the $3 million, uh, yeah, uh, okay. you wouldn't consider, uh, that was earned money. Okay. The client uh, paid for, knew about the work, paid for all that trial preparation, uh, even participated in making decisions about it and uh, uh, decisions that affected the, the expense. And so, yeah, that $3 million is not what was in dispute. It's what do you do with, okay, I've got a legal situation. It involves finishing this little, little bit of preparation and then trying this big case. Okay, $600,000 flat fee, you got it. Now, if you're terminated, the attorney is terminated, uh, you know, a week later, and 
does very little of the preparation work. Um, when you now try to allocate what refund is required, right. um, you you yeah, you, that's what was in dispute in my case, and so. Okay. Okay, the second question, I guess, is to you, you, Ken, or yeah, which is probably more just an educational point for me. How is a flat fee um, being able to be designated as property and go to operating fund versus in the trust? That's in the new rules. Okay, and, so it's the new rule. Yeah. Okay. And in, in, in the rules before 2018, um, you know, advanced fee payments, whether they had to go in a trust account or, or, or not, was undecided. They cleared that up in the new rules. So anytime there's an advanced fee deposit, it has to now go into the trust account until the money is earned. They, they made an exception for a flat fee. And that's what I was getting at with uh, all the public comments. There were a lot of flat fee lawyers who chimed in on the rules and this exception that's in the rules now seemed to flow from all that public comment feedback. So in the case of a flat fee, if the, you know, it's, you know, if the client is paying the fee up front or any portion of it up front, um, the default rule is it has to go into the trust account. But under the new rules, if the, the lawyer discloses to the client in writing that the client has the op, you know, that it can't require it to go in the trust account, uh, but the lawyer wants going to put it in the operating account, um, then the new rules provide for that, assuming they comply with the disclosures. And if it's over $1,000, they get all that in writing uh, and the client's consent in writing. So that's the it's, it's kind of an odd situation now where in this flat fee context, you have money that the lawyer hasn't earned. It's being paid up front, but it's going into the attorney's operating account where technically, you know, you can't have your client's money in your own operating account. It's supposed to go in the client's trust account. So it's, 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 it's it's what the rules provide now, and you know, but it creates some, you know, I think in my mind, there's some tension there. Whose money? You know, the rules make clear that if you don't complete it or you're terminated, you got to refund it. Um, but it, once it gets in the operating account, and I've run into that in fee arbitrations and, and similar types of matters, you know, where you know it's gone, you know, you know, it's gone into the operating account and the lawyer doesn't have it anymore. <laughs> They can't pay the refund. So that, what, was, yeah. what was the logic of making that change? Well, that's a good question. It seemed <laughs> like the in my, in my reading, and Randy, if you're still on, you might have some feedback on that. But my reading of the public comments and you know, was attorneys who work on flat fee agreements and, and the immigration ones came up frequently and criminal matters, it came up a lot. They, I guess, as I understood, the argument was they provide a, a valuable service to people who couldn't afford to pay on a straight hourly basis, and it's not something where a contingency would work. So by doing it on a flat fee, they are able to provide a legal service, but they need the money. So that's kind of the, the it seemed like the dynamic that the rules revision committee was going through was you know, how do you still allow for flat fee attorneys to provide this service to the public that needs it, um, but still be able to operate their businesses because they need the money to, you know, in the meantime, so. You know, the, and the, the, the distinction is significant in the sense that if the money is put into the general operating account, it can be reached by the attorney's creditors but not the client's creditors. If it's put into the trust account, it can be reached by the client's creditors, but not by the attorney's creditors. And that's a significant difference. And that went into our discussion on the section about what you have to do to get consent 
to put it in the trust in the uh, general account, uh, how detailed does that explanation have to be? Which is if it goes into my uh, attorney uh, general account, you lose. And if my creditors come after all my assets, they're going to take that 600,000 or whatever the number is, whether I perform the service or not, and thus might impact my ability to refund it if I don't complete the service. Yeah, that's the issue I kind of tried to tee up with scenario four with a slight twist. And then in the scenario four one, it was a situation where the lawyer knows they're having serious financial problems. Uh, and there's a risk that, you know, they could, you know, have their assets seized, enters into the flat fee agreement with the standard disclosures that, you know, they have under this, which are fairly minimal. And, you know, the lawyer's account then gets uh, attached by his creditors and the client fires the lawyer, but now the money's in the hands of the creditors. So. Still need to flush out the analysis on that one a bit more, but that's what the issue I was trying to get at with that scenario. Ken, your summation of the Rules of Risen Commission history background is, is pretty much right on. There were originally feelings that California should simply join the rest of the ABA jurisdictions and say that, uh, you know, as a generalized proposition, all advance fees like advance costs and expenses shall be deposited. Uh, into the, the client trust account. Uh, but then we received access arguments, uh, immigration, but also criminal defense and bankruptcy, where the concern was that funds residing in the client trust account are inherently the property of the client. And if you're a criminal defendant, it's subject to forfeiture or seizure by the prosecution. If it's in a bankruptcy matter, it's subject to seizure by creditors of the client. And attorneys who do those kinds of work on a flat fee basis might be um, less uh, interested in doing that type of work unless the money, the funds paid as advance fees actually pass as a matter of title to become the property of the lawyer. And the conundrum that you're picking out in terms of, well, well how can it be still refundable if it's the property of the lawyer? Um, when the commission was talking about it, they discussed it in terms of classic failure of consideration, you know, citing the example of a natural disaster or something else that happens where, yes, there was a contractual understanding that you have earned this, but the failure of consideration suggests that the lawyer should uh, pay back to the client the amounts that would otherwise result in a violation of 1.5, an unconscionable fee, or some other unjust enrichment to the attorney. So it's not the classic sense of refunding where it still belongs to the client we're paying you back. It's that I got paid, but I was unable to uh, complete my side of the bargain. And so uh, my part of the consideration contractually has failed and it would be improper for me to retain it and could be a violation of 1.5 as an unconscionable fee. So that's how they tried to rationalize it. Um, and they did provide for a benchmark approach in that last sentence of comment two mm -hmm. to try to deal with the vagaries of, well, do I have to wait till the entire case is over or not? Okay. Yeah, I'd forgotten that part about the uh, criminal and the bankruptcy attorneys talking about the trust account being seized. So, okay. Yeah, and also, uh, Randy, that, that's, that's, I don't think we in our drafting gave any consideration to the, the getting to the conclusion of, all right, if it all turns out that it's in the general account, it can't be refunded, now you've charged an unconscionable fee. I don't think we really considered that, uh, all that in detail. No, we don't. I mean, I think we approach it more as, you know, the, with the revisions, it makes clear that you have, you know, if it's paid in advance, it's going to be refundable, no matter what, you can't have a non-refundable advance fee anymore, unless it's the, uh, and that's where we used to get it a lot, you know, in the fee arbitrations is, I mean, the, uh, many of them were disputes with, between clients and their attorneys and criminal matters. And, Many of the cases we got in fee arbitration involved flat fee agreements, and they almost universally said that 
you know, the fee is fully earned on, upon payment and non-refundable. So, you know, in the new rule, they clean that up. So there's no such thing as that anymore. So that I think also ties in, you know, that, you know, it, it's always going to be refundable when I guess dependable, you know, irrespective of where it went. So, so yeah, we can, we can flush those out some more though. So my comment would be, it does seem that some milestones or deliverables associated with certain um, dates and or amounts would be advisable to include so that it's more clear um, starting out, here's what you get at each point, particularly since at any time the relationship could be terminated. Mm -hmm. So it just makes it. Um, yeah, and that's where with that new comment, you know, or not the new part that I put in with BNP code 6148, which where I said, I thought it might get a bit controversial. I was trying to, in the announcement I was making there is, because the comment to the new rules, comment, uh, comment to the rule that Randy just mentioned, you know, points out that the attorneys and their clients can agree in their fee agreement, you know, whether it be miles or whatever, how that's paid out. And I think when I, when, when I was, where I came from was reading that comment in, and, 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 and in conjunction with the BNP code requirements for what you have to have in your written fee agreement and in your billing records, um, kind of reading the two together, I think you, you know, I was kind of making the argument that you almost have to have a milestone. You have to have something in there. Otherwise it may not comply with 6148 because it doesn't explain when, how the fee is earned or, and you, you know, any kind of billing would not comply with that because it wouldn't comply, you know, when or how it's earned and how do you take it then? So. This is Dan. I was going to, I was going to say that too. I think that's right. I would agree with that point. Um, to me, the milestone question in the fee agreement is the solution to the valuation question because you agree up front. If you're a criminal lawyer or, or an immigration lawyer or even going to trial, you know what the milestones are. You could identify some. You know, for to use Joel's example, I would never charge X dollars for a trial. I might charge X dollars for pretrial motions and then. X dollars uh, for jury selection and X dollars for the case in chief. We sort of, we use flat fees, but we also have a rule of thumb that you don't ever want to be more than, you know, a couple of weeks out from earning another fee, basically. And if you're in this practice, you should be able to split up your tasks so that if there's a dispute, you're really not too far over the skis on how much you're unearned. I think it's required myself. I agree with you, Ken. Okay. Maybe it's not so controversial after all. <laughs> well, I think it will be controversial because people don't probably want to want to try to break it out. But they they should be able to do it. If you do the, if you're in a practice, you know what is required in a typical criminal defense or mm -hmm. immigration application or whatever it is you're doing. I would think. Yeah, when we get that far, I guess we'll find out in public comment. I didn't think the conversion clause when moving on down the line was all that controversial, but the public comments would suggest otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Well, but the concept of, of allocation is not foreign to a whole group of attorneys, say, who do contingent fee work. I mean, your usual thing is all uh, 30 percent up until 30 days before trial and then 40 percent. You know, it's a milestone which now affects the fee. Right. And as you point out, a lot of people put in there, um, uh, and in fact, I think in this contract we dealt with that had that got modified was it did have things like before trial, I'll need $150,000 to cover the pretrial work and this, that, and the other. So the concept of putting in money at certain times to cover certain tasks is not a foreign one even though it's a controversial one. I mean, I don't know whether it would be controversial. It probably would be, but I don't know whether, it, why it should be. Because yeah. if you know your tasks, and if, you're, if you don't know the tasks for trying a case, you shouldn't be charging a flat fee to do it. But if you know the tasks, you should be able to estimate something. And then the valuation question is more or less removed. 
even if you use a reasonable expectation standard, they're going to be met because you're going to say, I bargained for jury selection, I got it, and we move on. But, you know, that requires people to think up front in their fee agreements and put the numbers in. Mm -hmm. If you're going to charge a flat fee, that's to me, that's the way to protect yourself against a valuation dispute because you won't be very far from the previous milestone. Well, I mean, that's that's the whole point of 6148 anyway, which is if you comply with 6148 about everything you do, uh, then there's no dispute as to what the reasonable value is because you go to the contract value. Right. Uh, on, on the other hand, if you don't and you haven't specified what each of these components is worth, particularly uh, just like you haven't specified what your hourly rate is, is going to be worth if it's, it's not enforceable because of 6148, you're left with the reasonable value. And as we always say, when we train arbitrators, that means that, or I mean, when I lecture to the lawyers, uh, practitioners, they will, you know, you don't want that because you're leaving your beauty, your reasonable value in the minds of another beholder. And so right. you can protect yourself. So suggesting those protections is not a bad thing to do. I mean, one, one downside of it for a practitioner is that if something takes a lot less time than you thought it would, or the case settles on day three of the trial, right? And you have, if you have no milestones and you're going to probably have a good argument that you should get the whole 600 because it's just, you know, you did the trial. But if you have milestones, it's going to be very easy for the for the client to withhold additional amounts. That may be one reason people are resistant to it. I don't think it's a good argument. I think you're right. I was, I gonna, say, I was gonna say, Dan, so they wanna steal money. Is that what that well, <laughs> they wanna keep it. <laughs> yeah, it's not you know, a good argument. They wanna keep on money they haven't really earned. Right. That's not a good argument, you're right. I right. agree with you. <laughs> I, I wouldn't we... do it that way. I don't, we don't do it that way, but I also feel like it takes I mean, it has another salutary effect, which is to illustrate for the client how much time and energy you think these different phases will take. And if it's vastly off, like, you know, of the 600,000, if it's going to cost 300,000 to do jury selection, the client might ask, why does that take up half the, you know, effort, for example, or, or if there's some other expectation that is mismatched, you see it when you outline those milestones. Yeah, my view is they're, you know, in many ways, more of a client protection type feature, which is, I think is the whole idea behind 6148. You make it clear up front. Um, so, you know, this way the client, you know, knows what to expect. I think they're firm protective too, because they get what they expect. It's there on the page. Yeah. And so of course, they have to pay for it. Anyone else have any? Thoughts on the, this draft or? Kevin, why do you think it may be? I mean, Kevin, Ken, why do Kevin's, you? Kevin's the actor, but everybody does that. <laughs> uh, you all have this resemblance, yeah. the handsome yeah, man. I wish, but. <laughs> um, why do you think it? the public comments will be? Um... I just thought it'd be controversial because I've not, Nothing in 61, well, 6148 does mention flat fees, but I've never seen anything in articles, case law, you know, tying the requirements of 6148 to putting in like milestones for earned fees and a flat fee. That's the only reason I thought it'd be somewhat controversial. I, I, I just haven't seen that anywhere. Yeah, Maybe. but the... the, the... The controversy, if you will, came about because of the change in the rule. Mm -hmm. Before then, the general concept was, I'm going to charge you $100,000 to do these things in your case. And if all of a sudden it resolves after you write one letter or something like that, uh, you've earned it. You say, hey, I completed the task. The case resolved successfully. I've earned the six hundred. I've earned the $100,000. Now what it says is that that's not true um, necessarily um, yeah. if in the case that you're terminated before you get to the result that you promised at the end of the day, which is a successful termination of the case. 
So I'm I'm comfortable with the analysis. If it turns out to be controversial, so be it. If not, I'll be pleasantly surprised, and we'll have cleared that up on in this draft, I guess. When's the next meeting now? Is it January? January thirteenth. Thirteenth. Okay. Uh, it's good. Not not as bad as Justin. I have a trial on on uh, January 9th, so <laughs> a little bit better than the third. So I don't know if, if you know. I guess if, unless there's further comments, I probably what I need to do is have Joel and Brandon get together and we'll zoom and try and nail some of these things down and clean it up for the next draft. So I, I would like to get to the point where we can do the further revisions and maybe get it out for public comment. So. Ken, I've got a couple comments. Um, I, I'm I'm probably in the contrarian view on the 6148, but let's just assume for the sake of discussion, we we're going to throw that out there and and see what sticks. Okay. I'm wondering if we if we can bolster that argument um, a little bit. And it sounds to me like there may not be any authority uh, that we can use that interprets 6148, but maybe there's there's other things. You know, I was thinking of as we were talking just seeing if there are any recommended flat form for, forms for flat fee agreements out there. And um, you might have come across this because I see you mentioned a Colorado case, but apparently the Colorado Supreme Court approved a form. And it talks about basically what we're talking about, where you have two options. You know, you have the de description of the various milestone and what's earned at, at each respective milestone, or if it's just one task when the fees earned based on performing that one task. So you know, maybe we can, you know, it's more of a practice pointer type of um, addition or footnote or whatever we're going to do with it, but to show that these types of um, the guidance that we're suggesting or, or trying to lead folks who use flat flat fees uh, to, to, to protect themselves and clients is already out there, that we're not treading new ground and, and there are resources and exemplars that they can use to come up with better agreements um, for the reasons that we've outlined. So um, I throw out that Colorado example as one and, and maybe- Yeah, Colorado is interesting. Their rule is, you know, is far more detailed than what we have. It, it right. goes into very specifics on, 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 on flat fees and, and what, far more than we have here. That's why they even have, like I said, they even have their approved form flat fee. We've got a, We've got one on the state bar website, but it you know it, it predates uh, uh, the the rules revisions. But yeah, it's not a fact. Uh, it's, yeah. um, I, I don't. We don't need to retread this today, but I just want to flag maybe for the January or February discussion, but it, but it was after our January meeting that um, we'll have to come to a landing point on how we talk about that prior opinion that wasn't approved. And I think we've gone back and forth in a number of meetings, but um, at the risk of someone saying I didn't bring it up, I still think that's an outstanding issue for us to talk about as we finalize this. I uh, don't think we need to do it today because we've already done it before, but um, that's it. That's all I got for today. Okay. Yeah, where I kind of landed on that so far is along the lines with you know, the uh, ethics hotliner thing that COPRAC put out after that opinion on midstream modifications fell through was close scrutiny. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'll take a further look at that. We can land on, on the midstream revision a little bit more specifically because I think right now I talk about the other, and I think you got a good point. I talked about the opinions in Utah and Texas on that, but I don't tie it up at the end in terms of the California position. So, all right. Thank you. Anybody else? I guess not. So, I guess, you know, Joel and then Brandon, I'll shoot you guys, see what you got some availability in the next couple of weeks, and maybe we can set up a Zoom and, and, and tie down on some of these issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Ken. Um, hey, Sarah, this, yeah. is this is Cassidy. I just, I my video doesn't work. 
it says the host has stopped it. I tried to send some messages to Mimi and Erica, but I haven't heard back. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. It, it's happened a few times to others as well. Okay. I've been here though, just so you guys know. <laughs> um, and I, I now realize I, I left uh, a gap in the agenda um, for a half hour gap. So we, we, ha we have plenty of time now. <laughs> Uh, but the next item up on the agenda, because uh, I didn't cover 130 to two, but the next item on our agenda is the cryptocurrency opinion. And I'm thinking maybe we should turn to that. Um, I don't know. And I think, Bill, thanks for putting that uh, revised draft, working on it. Sure. Um, if you want to start the discussion, that would be great. Yeah. So this is kind of really a second draft. And, and this was, this came up late because I, I got this to Eleanor and Justin Sunday, recognizing obviously it was a holiday weekend, and I didn't imagine that they would get to take a look at this draft. Um, so, uh, and I didn't have my notes from the last two meetings, unfortunately. Um, I, I did recall some discussion at the LA meeting that I tried to, which made me revise this to include that it was acceptable to take um, an advance fee uh, via cryptocurrency provided uh, the safeguarding um, procedures were uh, complied with as well as 1.8.1, uh, um, which is different from my prior view. I didn't think you could do that, but as I thought about it more, you know, I think of it, you know, it's no different than lawyers having, you know, medical records or financial records for clients. So you have to safeguard those um, and it's entirely permissible to do that. I don't see why you couldn't uh, keep a fee uh, that is not traditionally considered money um, <clears throat> in compliance with rule 1.15. Uh, and so, so that's the change from the last version. Um, the other comments that, that Justin did forward it to me the other uh, yesterday uh, talked about the issue of kind of intertwining the crypto, you know, the rules that we think are applicable in the context of cryptocurrency. And actually, I'd done that in an earlier version when Eleanor and I were, were going back and forth um, on that. Um, and I think that's a good point that, that Justin raises is to tie those, you tie those rules into the specific cryptocurrency as opposed to just laying out the rules and then going into discussion about cryptocurrency with those rules. I think it's helpful to, to include some discussion about how that particular rule applies to cryptocurrency in the context of discussing the rule. Um, I, try, I don't want to be too redundant, but I think it would be helpful. And that was the other reason why when I did an earlier version that I did do that, um, I thought the idea of, and I think Eleanor agreed with me that the idea of putting hypotheticals, um, we thought about do, uh, not including hypotheticals if we were gonna do it that route where we were talking about the rule and then how cryptocurrency applies to that particular rule. Um, so I, I thought that might be redundant if you then do a, a couple of hypotheticals, basically regurgitating what you just said you know, in the pages before. So I think it can easily be done without hypotheticals. Um, and so that's kind of my focus and what I want to talk to Eleanor and Justin about um, going forward. Um, I did include, and, and it, the other comment was kind of condensing down the discussion about uh, the prior uh, opinions from other jurisdictions about the use of cryptocurrency as payment maybe putting that, that in footnotes as opposed to in the, the, the body of, of the opinion. And, and uh, quite frankly, I, I don't have any preference in that regard. Um, I did include a discussion in this draft about the Ohio opinion that came out uh, you know, fairly recently. It might've been after the last meeting. Um, I did include that just to hit the highlights of it. I didn't think it was particularly helpful because that really is involved a situation where the law firm was acting as a true escrow agent um, for a, uh, as a, as a third party dealing with non-legal related services. So there was a little bit of distinction there about that. And, the, and it focused really on two points. One, 
the idea of uh, accepting cryptocurrency, it's not really considered money. Uh, it doesn't meet all the qualifications of money and is treated as property and thus subject to 1.8.1, uh, which I agree with. Um, and then it had a fairly cursory discussion about how you safeguard uh, the cryptocurrency in that context. I mean, it was helpful, um, but it's nothing really different than what perhaps other opinions have discussed in that regard. You know, you want to make sure that it's secure, you have proper procedures in place to prevent cyber attacks, uh, things of that nature, you know, double uh, or dual authentication, encryption, using a cold wallet versus a hot wallet, cold wallet meaning it's offline, not, not online. Um, so I, I mean, I agree with that. And so I kind of, when I did this draft, I included that discussion about 1.15 in more detail than what was previously discussed. Um, but that's, a, that's about it. That's where we are currently. Um, I guess the other issue would be, I, I see really three scenarios uh, where this applies. One being when you're, when you're making a payment with cryptocurrency for services already performed, you, you, know, you, build, you, know, you have a bill for $10,000 for work that's already done, you send it to the client and they wanna pay you in cryptocurrency. Uh, in that situation, I agree with, the other opinions uh, that it you know 1.8.1 doesn't apply there. Uh, it's it's a pretty straightforward transaction. Um, the other two scenarios would be when you get an advance fee or retainer, um, how that's treated. And then when we were talking about flat fees today, it made me think about that as well. Um, I think it's also obviously applicable there, although the, the analysis may not be too much different than. The situation involving an advance fee where 1.8.1 and certainly 1.15 apply in both those situations. Uh, it really would come down to the disclosures that will be required uh, of the lawyer uh, to comply with 1.8.1. <clears throat> and so, I mean, that's that's kind of the status of the the, the opinion now. Um, I am not wedded to the idea of you know, keeping an advance fee or a flat fee. If, you, if the lawyer could actually comply with 1.15, I, I am open to uh, comments about that. Um, I, I think that would be helpful because I know that was one of the main issues that, that certainly Eleanor and I had when we were doing the initial drafts is whether or not the lawyer could actually comply with that that rule when you're talking about an advance fee or a flat fee dealing with crypto. <clears throat> so uh, anyone have any comments or suggestions? I'm all ears. Did they have a discussion on the FTX collapse in there? <laughs> I did, yeah, I did put that in there as well. Uh, just to you know, bring home the fact that it's it, extremely volatile. <clears throat> I mean, the idea, I think, from my perspective would be, although I don't, you know, although there is no prohibition, I, I would argue, that although there's no prohibition to receiving cryptocurrency as a form of payment for an advance fee or flat fee, uh, in my mind, I would want to scare a lawyer such that they wouldn't want to do it, quite honestly. I mean, there's no prohibition, but you, I think if you you have to jump through a lot of hoops and make a lot of disclosures in my mind um, that may make it, that may just discourage lawyers from doing it all together, which I think would be fine because I personally would never do it. Um, but then again, I don't, uh, I don't, I, I mean, I do have a trust account, but I don't like, <laughs> it's used very infrequently because I do mostly mediations and expert work, such that I don't really need that, but um, you know, I personally would not do it. I would not, or I would take it and immediately exchange it into fiat currency and deposit it into my trust account and, and not have to worry about it. <clears throat> well, I haven't had a chance to take the, the closest look at this, but um, I felt like previously in my own mind, I guess, um, that 
a, a more fulsome discussion of 1.8.1 would be helpful. And here we have it now. So I think it's just a matter of um, refining refining this to the extent um, we collectively have edits to it. But I think it's a very helpful discussion right. and um, really helps round out the opinion. Okay. Uh, everything you said, Bill, I'm not going to repeat because I agree in terms of you know some of the approaches that we can look at in terms as we as we um, refine this make, make good sense to me. So okay. um, just thank you for putting in the 1.8.1 and the safe the safe um, guarding piece as well. Um, I think ties nicely with the or, you know earlier reference to the to the rule and its applicability. We then now flesh that out here towards sure. the end of the opinion. So I think that's a, a helpful piece as well. And it's just a matter, like I said, of, uh, of refining. Um, so this is moving along um, very nicely. Good. Well, thank you for making my job easy, everyone, with no questions or comments so far. <laughs> well, so I did have one follow-up question that relates to, you, you said you were discussing this with Eleanor too, but about the issue of whether you can comply with rule 1.15a um, as to advance using cryptocurrency for um, advanced fee payments. Right. So um, I'm not, I, I admit I actually haven't had a chance to carefully digest this a revised opinion yet, but I'm not, from looking at it quickly, I'm not seeing kind of that analysis or, or discussion in here as much. It would be, it may, maybe I just overlooked it, but I would, um, I, I know it seems like you're ultimately concluding, yes, you you can accept it for advance fees um, and the rev revisions, but I'm just not seeing the, the analysis of, you know, that might reflect, you know, what you discussed in terms of how you could still comply with real 1.15. Yeah, I think that needs to be more developed um, in that regard, Sarah. Um, you know, one of the things is the difficulty with with cryptocurrencies because it's not it doesn't meet all the qualifications of money. You can't put it into your trust account. So uh, your, your your traditional trust accounting procedures uh, don't necessarily apply because you can't put it in a trust account. Although I, I believe that you still have to have something very similar in terms of your accounting for the, the cryptocurrency, as long as you're holding it in however you're holding it, um, uh, you know, whether it's monthly accounting, weekly accounting, uh, I think it would still have to, the lawyer would still have to do that uh, for purposes of complying with 1.15, however that's determined. But, you know, that's got to be, uh, I think the minimum for a trust account is it's monthly if, if I'm not if I'm correct, I, again, I don't handle trust accounts too often, so I don't, uh, I'm not an expert in trust accounts, but I think from accounting purposes, it has to be at least monthly, if I'm not mistaken. So I think as long as the lawyer does that, you know, from the accounting perspective to know what's in, what goes out, um, you know, in this instance, valuation may be, even be considered uh, because it's so volatile. Uh, you, you know, you run into the situation that, um, you know, let's say it's time to, you, you're sending out your monthly bill and, you know, the, the, the client has, you know, deposited the equivalent of $25,000 in cryptocurrency and, and you send out your first bill and it's for $15,000 at the beginning of the, you know, the following month. And in that time period, the cryptocurrency has gone from 25,000 in value to, you know, 10,000 in value. Uh, you know, you obviously, obviously got to make sure that the client is aware that that can happen. And if you have the, the accounting to show that that has in fact happened and also understanding that the client is going to have to bear the, 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 the loss uh, for that difference in, in, in valuation. When it, kind, when it comes time to pay the bill, that's the type of disclosures you're gonna need in, in, you know, for purposes of 1.8.1 and, and in your fee agreement. Uh, but that type of accounting I think is, gonna, is required. Monthly, weekly, whatever the case may be, I think that's gonna be the, the bare minimum, whatever the requirements are for a traditional trust account should, be, uh, should apply equally as well here. 
uh, even though you're not using the trust account. <clears throat> but that that needs to be. I, I need to flesh that out more in the in the analysis for sure. Okay, that makes sense. And I, I think, um, yeah, part of it is I think a little. I, I believe the reasoning for why, if I'm understanding that 1.15a, because it's cryptocurrency is considered property, um, is why you're concluding ultimately that subsection A wouldn't necessarily apply to require you to deposit that into the trust account because it's not. And I just think I know you make that point earlier on in the opinion that it's not that it's considered property, but I think repeating that in the section where you discuss the real 1.15 potential application would be helpful. Okay. Yep. We'll do. Um, but thanks. I, I do think um, this is moving along really well and um, hopefully we'll be in a position to, to vote on it. I know there's more work that needs to be done, not, not at this meeting, but in a in the near future. Sure. Yeah. Hopefully by the next meeting, I, we will have a, a much a, a much better draft that's, you know, in, in much better shape where, you know, I won't say be final, but <laughs> be much closer to being final than than what it is right now, obviously. I uh, have a comment and a question, Bill, which yep. my question, I think you just started answering which was the client is going to bear the responsibility of the shift in value that's that's something that needs to be certainly set forth in the fee agreement and there has to be an under, the client has to understand the volatility in that you know it's going to go up and down and you know i'm, I'm willing a I'm, I'm the lawyer willing to keep it but understand that it's it goes up and down on a daily basis and if when the time comes, and that's one the other disclosures, you got to you know determine, at least in my view, when you're going to value uh, value the cryptocurrency. Like when you, you send out your bills the first of the month, that's when we value the the cryptocurrency. Okay, uh, if, if it comes to that time in the first of the month and that has declined, the, the client certainly needs to be aware of that and understand that you know the client needs to to bear bear that loss recognize well you may need to come out some money some come out of pocket some money to to pay this bill given the volatility of the of the cryptocurrency and by the same token if it goes up uh you know that has to be discussed as well and i think that and that one is really more uh appropriate when you're talking about the flat fee i think it's critical in, in the flat fee context that you know, let's say as we talked about, you have your, your milestones, and you know, at this milestones, I get twenty five percent of it. Let's say you've, you've you've completed all the milestones, and your flat fee was five thousand dollars, for example, for whatever work you were going to do. And when the time comes where you, you've met all of the milestones, and now you have earned that fee, and now the uh, the value of that crypto cryptocurrency is now ten thousand dollars. Does the lawyer get that extra five thousand dollars? I mean, then you're talking about one point five issue, you know, conscionability issue, which I, I I didn't touch upon too much in here, but I will. Um, so that's another issue, you know. And then the issue that this along the same lines is, let's say, even if you have an advance fee, you know, the relationship goes sour, and the client or the lawyer decides they are going to terminate the relationship, and the cryptocurrency is valued at that point, you know, whether it goes up or down, I mean, who's going to bear the loss uh, of that? And, you know, does that then again, you know, if it goes up, does that trigger uh, a 1.5 analysis? So a lot of, a lot of moving parts. Okay. Thank you. Based on that, I have two comments now. So I'll comment on that. I would think that the client would say we should share the risk meaning we should go into a volatile fee arrangement or using a volatile currency, if you will, sharing the risk. If it goes down, I'm not gonna pay you any more because if it goes up, I'm not gonna ask for more. I'm not gonna ask for money back, right? right. It seems like the way you an just answer that question, the client bears much more of the risk 
of a volatile currency. And I'm presuming perhaps you may be thinking that way because it's at their pleasure that the attorney would accept that type of payment. I'm, I'm right. not sure, but, but that it strikes me as this may be more of a share of the risk because of the volatility. So that, that'd be one comment. The second comment is based on the executive director strategic plan in October. It seems to me that this crypto, we should address it in the broader tech and law that she um, outlined some of the areas that she thought we should consider. And while we, we haven't had a chance to talk about that strat plan and that presentation in some of the suggestions, I thought they were suggestions, um, not, not in any way saying we had to do certain things. But to me, crypto is a, is a subset of a bigger, a, a, really of a bigger area. And right. so, um, my sense is when this was started, we weren't talking about the larger area, but since we have the potential to be talking about the larger area, I think it should be folded in or not finalized um, before we think about the other pieces. Because if we decide to think about the other pieces, the crypto piece is very much uh, a foundational element, I, I would think, over. Sure. And, then, you know, the, the... I think the other thing that uh, we're certainly going to put in a footnote is given, you know, what, what's happened to FTX and the, you know, the huge crash, I think that's more impetus on regulators to, to regulate crypto. And that, that will certainly, that will certainly change the, the, the playing field if that occurs. And that would probably require us to do another opinion on that based upon what, whatever these regulations are. Uh, and, you know, I, I, if I had to, if I'm a betting person, that's going to happen. Obviously, I, it's I, I can't imagine cryptocurrency going to is going to still exist without some type of regulation at some point. And given the volatility, I think it's it inures to the benefit of everyone if if it is regulated. Um, so I, you know th that will that's going to be a caveat to the opinion, and certainly will be in a footnote that you know this this opinion. Will certainly change or can change if and when regulations come about to, to regulate cryptocurrency much more uh, akin to either securities or and or fiat currency um, certainly but yeah I, I i'm open i mean if there's other larger issues that we need to discuss uh that the, that the committee thinks we should discuss in this regard uh, i'm certainly certainly open to that for sure Anyone else? Okay. <clears throat> Unless there are any other comments, I'm gonna suggest we just take a, a short 10 minute break um, and come back at 2.30. Good. Okay. All right, thank you. Item set. So I wanted to move on to the, the next item on our agenda, which is um, the State Bar Board of Trustees has referred to COPRAC for consideration a potential um, consideration of an, a new rule um, based on ABA model rule 8.3, um, which is commonly referred to as a snitch rule, um, which would refer re require attorneys to report misconduct uh, of other attorneys to the state bar. And I know 
um, this rule was previously considered by um, rules revision commissions um, and rejected for different reasons. And some of the, I think, materials attached to this memo um, went over the, the reasoning for um, declining to adopt um, rule 8.3, but we are being asked to um, reconsider um, adoption of, of rule 8.3. So I think um, I'll open it up for discussion, but I, I think it's an initial matter. Um, you know, we're going to, we should form a, a working group to focus on um, this potent consideration of this rule. Um, so we can get into it more at a future meeting. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if people are ready at this meeting to discuss it in, in detail, but I wanted to raise it with a group. And um, first I'll see if, um, actually, I'm not sure if I see her. I, I don't know if Eric, oh yeah, sorry, Eric, I didn't see you for a moment. Erica, I, I don't know if, um, if you wanna provide kind of an overview um, for us to, to, to think about, and, and then we can go on to maybe thinking about a, a appointment of a, a working group and, and some more discussion. Sure, absolutely. So um, I can give you kind of a high level overview and then just tell you that what we was provided in the materials that were posted are some of the materials related to this project. So whoever joins the working group, um, there, there will be more materials surrounding this, mostly related to what's um, called kind of the Sondheim Commission, which was the first rules revision commission. Um, and that is the group that actually um, put forth a, a, a um, version of 8.3 to be recommended that was ultimately um, rejected. But so in sum, um, this was discussed at the November uh, 2023 Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, the chair of the board um, in, in his chair's report actually asked the secretary to refer this to COPREC for consideration, as you'll see on the um, shared screen right now. Uh, COPREC is being asked to re uh, provide its recommendations regarding the rule at the um, May 2023 Board of Trustees meeting. So it's a relatively quick time frame if you uh, consider that the Ethics Symposium is one of our upcoming meetings. So um, I'd have to double check the calendar, but I believe we have meetings January, March, and there I think there's three meetings that COPREC is meeting in addition to the symposium, but um, I would have to confirm that. I'd have to pull up the calendar. Um, but so what, what you see here is essentially um, a couple different items uh, working from most recent to um, the oldest, that being uh, what was submitted to the California Supreme Court regarding um, proposed amendments to the rules of professional conduct and concepts that were not recommended for adoption, which includes, you know, the ultimate recommendation recommendation to not um, put forth uh, a version of ABA model rule 8.3. Uh, related to that, you'll also see several um, agenda materials from the Rules Revision Commission that discussed these issues, um, the, the broader materials as well as some working group materials, and then um, Finally, as I, as I mentioned, um, a brief item from the uh, Sondheim Commission talking about um, this, this matter. So um, I don't, we can definitely discuss, you know, ABA model rule 8.3 itself. I don't know if we want to talk about some of the variations that exist in other states. Um, it just kind of depends on how deeply the group wants to delve into this today. Okay. And could you give um, some more insight on the reasoning why we're being asked to reconsider adoption of this rule again? Absolutely. So it, it, it surrounds the, um, the, Gir the Girardi issue, essentially. So one of the aspects related to the um, related to all of this is that th th there's um, consideration being made that if attorneys in California were required, that, that perhaps attorneys knew what was going on surrounding that incident um, or incidents. And if um, attorneys would have had a version of 8.3 within California, perhaps there would have been more attention to this and some of the um, misconduct would have um, been stopped earlier. 
And so there's been, um, I don't know, I, we, we can pull the articles, we have the articles, and we can certainly share them with some of the working group, but there's articles that have been recently uh, published in like the Daily Journal and the Recorder, uh, those attorney publications, I believe one in um, the, a few in the LA Times surrounding this, but they all talk about, you know, why does California not have a version of 8.3 when the majority of jurisdictions do? Okay, thanks. That's helpful um, to understand the background. Um, and I, I will admit, I actually have not had a chance to really carefully digest the, all of the materials relating to the background and, and the reasoning um, of why the Rules Revision Commission, you know, I'd like to understand more their, re their prior reasoning, um, and I know it's in the materials, um, you know, but um, I don't know if others have and, and want to weigh in on, um, you know, whether they potentially having Cal California adopt a similar version to ABA model rule at 8.3, or if you've looked at other states' jurisdictions and have, have thoughts, I kind of welcome, welcome that feedback now from the group. And then I think it probably makes sense as next steps to really um, see who's interested in serving as, as part of a working group to really delve into this more. Um, and, and I'm happy to do so, but I, I will, um, I, mean, I wanna just open it up for others to speak. Yeah, you know, uh, um, one, I would be happy to be on the subcommittee, first of all, this is Bill. Um, but I, you know, I I've actually was retained as an expert in a case in another jurisdiction where you had uh, opposing counsel report uh, the lawyer that I was asked to provide some expert opinions relating to. Um, and uh, to me, uh, this rule to me is offensive um, because now you are thrusting upon me the duty to report someone else. Uh, right now we have a self-reporting you know, requirement here in California, but there's no preclusion if if I'm dealing with opposing counsel in a case that I think you know he or she may have committed a a violation of the rules of professional conduct that goes goes to his or her fitness. There's nothing pre pre precluding me from reporting that that lawyer. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't want. I just don't want to be in, uh, something imposed upon me that I have to report something maybe I missed, maybe I didn't see that. Um, and then all of a sudden now I'm subject to discipline because I didn't report it because maybe I missed it for whatever reason. I think this is a bad rule. I don't understand why the ABA uh, has this rule. Um, I can be convinced otherwise, but this is not something I would ever be a proponent of um, uh, under any circumstance, I don't think. So maybe I'm probably not a good person to be on the subcommittee, <laughs> I'm just saying. I think this is a bad rule. Uh, well, Bill, I may, oh. Bill, the, uh, you know, those of us who've been participating on the APRL um, discussion, this has been a topic now that's been going on back and forth for a good month, I think. And some of the things I kind of found interesting was that uh, there's a perception out there that the reason that we should reconsider this rule is our famous uh, trust account uh, violation case. And, uh, but it was pointed out that there were apparently uh, uh, 175 plus complaints already brought against uh, Mr. Girardi before the state bar did anything. So what good would the rule do to have closed that barn door? Right. The second thing is, is the offense that you're talking about, which I think is is somewhat a viewpoint that's shared, uh, particularly by our former colleague on this committee, Dave Carr. And um, the other thing someone pointed out, the question came up as well, has anybody ever heard of a prosecution, uh, a disciplinary uh, prosecution? against an attorney for failure to prosecute. And somebody pointed out that the only one they could find was a case in Kentucky where the attorney who was interested in the case uh, opposing counsel went to the press before going to file the disciplinary complaint under their rule 8.3 and the office of trial counsel in that state, I think it was Kentucky, 
was really pissed off that they'd been upstaged. So they brought a complaint against the attorney for failing to uh, report to the state bar as opposed to going to the press first. Right. And all those things kind of added up in my mind to this is an offensive and a, a useless and a silly rule. On the other hand, uh, there is some wisdom that has been put forth, at least in the discussion from the other states, as to why uh, they think it's a good rule, which would be worth studying before we made a decision. And um, also one of the uh, points that was made, I think it was in Illinois, uh, where they've adopted a modified rule of 8.3, where they've enumerated the kinds of things that should be reported um as opposed to just any violation that could be reported and uh, i think the enumeration was limited to <clears throat> a discrete number of pretty egregious types of violations which to me um in terms of uh, the viewpoint of cleaning up the profession or the uh, integrity of the profession might be worth taking a look at so while through all this discussion uh, that I've been following and actually participating in, uh, I've remained on the side of, uh, I'm not sure we need 8.3 in California, but uh, it's certainly something that if we're asked to look at, uh, we might wanna throw ourselves into and um, see if we can't sort through <clears throat> what you point out is the, the, uh, the initial offensive nature of it, which, pushes some of us away from it. And I, and I think the other the other issue that that would concern me is that it would be used as an, uh, uh, an offensive tactic by opposing counsel. Um, it always can be now. I mean, you can yeah, still- Yeah, it can be now, report. yeah, sure. But if we're, if we're required to do it, and then it's even more so uh, uh, problematic. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Bill, on that point. And I, I was also concerned too about um, we're focused on the duty to report other lawyers, but subsection B of the model rule at least judges. requires that you report judges. And there's a lot of concerns about doing that, at, you know, out of fear that, you know, somehow it will impact your case negatively if you report the judge. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think that, I, I'm not sure that that complaint would necessarily be confidential. So um, there are, um, I, I think there are a lot of issues that come up from required reporting as opposed to optional. All right. May may I just uh, raise a point? I'm curious as to Coprac's um, ability to comment or um, uh, analyze the disciplinary role of the state bar. And I, and I raise it for this reason. We were previously asked for input on the uh, client trust accounting certification that arose out of the Girardi scandal. And we're seeing the conversations about a potential rule 8.3 arise out of the potential Girardi scandal. And I have very strong feelings because I read the audit of the 175 plus complaints against the Girardi firm and Tom Girardi. There was no shortage of complaints, no shortage of rules and no shortage of laws that were broken. So I, I don't want to be part of an effort that acts as if we're fixing something with more rules. I would really be interested in figuring out what role, if any, we have in providing any guidance or recommendation for fixing the actual problem that, that occurs. Um, and I just don't know the ambit of our jurisdiction to comment or inquire um, and, and provide suggestions, because I think the problem is much deeper than any of these rules, personally. Well, Sarah, am I correct that as far as jurisdiction, whether we have it or not, we've been asked to do it. So um, I don't know that we just should shy away from it without at least taking a look at it. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm Joe. My point was, uh, I think it, we're we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, yeah, adopting that rule, but Joel, my my point was only that um, if we're going to talk about this rule, I do really 
want the ability to place it in a larger context um, because the rule is almost beside the point that we're all concerned about and that is generating the discussion for the rule and, and that sort of thing. How much are we allowed to get into beyond the scope of just this proposed rule? Yeah, and I'll 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 defer to more to COPREC staff on this, but um, you know my, my understanding is, is that we're we're directed to prepare a proposal, but I I don't think that prevents us from as we've done in connection with the other memos that we provided relating to um, as you mentioned CTAP and also relating to the um, civility amendments from presenting you know what our our opinion is. And if we think there are better, you know, solutions than a new rule, I, I absolutely think we should state so um, up front. Yet still, because we're being directed to do so, um, prepare a proposal that that you know, pursuant to our direction, even even though we we might ultimately disagree that a rule should be adopted at all. And it sounds like most of us who have spoken so far disagree. <laughs> With um, that, that there should that there's a need for a, a mandatory reporting rule, but nonetheless, I, I think we can still present our viewpoints and at the same time, you know, present a proposal. Well, um, but uh, but I'll ahead. stop. It. I, I was just gonna, if you want to say something, Joel, and then I was also gonna wait for um, if if staff could weigh in as well, I'd appreciate it. But if, if you want to say something first, Joel. Well, yeah, I, I I don't know if you recall, maybe it was a year, year and a half ago, my profound objections to adopting all these trust accounting rules when there was one bad actor and maybe a few others uh, who now made us all into criminals unless uh, we proved our innocence. And it, it, it really offended me that at the end of the day, what we had to say uh, just seemed to be, well, that's nice window dressing. We're going to do what we think we have to do to satisfy uh, whatever needs the state bar felt they had, including publicity and things like that. I just don't want to see this happen again. And I'd like to get some sense and maybe staff can give it to us is just how much is this referral to us really looking for an opinion uh, from an ethics point of view, an improvement of the profession point of view, as opposed to, well, let's just say we send it to COPRAC and then do what we want to do. Um, I'm happy to to address this to the extent I can. Um, so, in regards to uh, what 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 Sarah indicated that um, the the task is the assignment, as it says, essentially in the um, transmittal from the board secretary, is to to prepare a proposal for a rule. So that does include, you know, actually actually drafting rule language. That being said, um, I think to also to Sarah's point, there's there's nothing that indicates that that COPRAC could not indicate their position on the rule, including their non-support in a similar manner to what was done surrounding the the um, rule amendments related to the CTAP changes, the client trust account client trust account protection program. And then uh, Joel, in regards to kind of what you what you're indicating, there are many variations of Rule 8.3, I mean, you raised the Illinois example, which I think is a, is a good one. And so um, recognizing that some of the individuals here may not agree with having any version of 8.3 in California, I think certainly lending your expertise to um, surrounding ethics to this issue is something that the board is certainly hoping for in really evaluating some of these issues related to how the rule was proposed in California previously, the reasons it was rejected, um, for example, one of the proposals related to um, only requiring reporting if there was a felony um, or if the conduct r rose to the level of a felony, but you know what constitutes a felony and whether or not an attorney who maybe doesn't practice in criminal law knows that or should know that is an, you know, an interesting question. And so I think really looking to this committee's expertise in this area is what the Board of Trustees is hoping. So um, recognizing that they, they will take I think they I think they do certainly consider your opposition, assuming that's what is ultimately, you know, determined regarding the rule into account, but there are, you know, many issues at play here. And so it's it's going to ultimately be not only the will of the board, but as we all know, you know, these rules are adopted and approved by the California Supreme Court. So it goes beyond that to to what wants to be said. And it looks like Randy's gonna save me from myself right here. Uh, no, I just wanted to 
add one thing and it's it's in the materials and if you put aside this uh, Girardi context the things that the rules revision commissions both the Sondheim and the Justice Edmund commissions really had to wrestle with over the years and this goes back a long time um, it's the fact that if you look at that ABA table of state adoptions uh, every jurisdiction in the United States, except for California, has a version of this rule. Um, 21 of the jurisdictions have the exact same rule as the ABA. The one sort of standout in this table is that California is listed as reserved, which is completely accurate because that's how it came back when the Supreme Court issued its order approving the comprehensive amendments in 2018. 8.3 was listed as reserved. And that's where we stand today. And um, the prior uh, commission uh, voice on the issue of being exceptional in this regard really has been a client interest position. And so uh, a mandatory obligation to report arguably would in many instances, or at least some instances, be at odds with a potential client's uh, best interests. And so if it's a civil litigation matter and you're on the brink of settlement of a very sort of difficult case, something arises and you believe that the other attorney have personal knowledge that would be reasonable that the other attorney opposing counsel has committed a violation and you are required to report it, um, then that could unwind that settlement for the client. And so the commission has expressed the view that um, the exceptionalism for California is really client-based. Um, at the same time, it's hard to look at a table like this and say, why is California any different? The rationale of this rule is that as officers of the court, uh, the privilege that attorneys enjoy include uh, a reasonable obligation to self-police the profession. And the versions of the rules uh, protect confidentiality and privilege. They protect participation in, say, lawyer assistance programs. We might have to tweak it, talk about mediation confidentiality, which is new and strong in California. But I think you guys are, are our best shot <laughs> after many iterations from the commission to take a fresh look at this and, and see where it can go. Um, um, you wouldn't be alone. You would be in line with the history in terms of some of the positions of some of the commission members if it didn't wholeheartedly embrace this policy. But I do think we're looking for uh, a draft that would be your best effort. And uh, I think that's why it was preferred. May I, uh, may I ask if in the prior history of the, these considerations, there was ever a draft rule that carved out exceptions for, you know, um, you don't have to make such a report uh, until such time as it would not interfere with your client's interests or this or that to, to get around it. Are you aware? Of, I just don't know the history. I haven't read the materials yet. So the, the versions that was the last version is in the materials. Uh, a lot of the prior versions were keying off the older uh, versions of the model rule and maybe even the model code. Uh, so they're not that relevant right now, but I don't think anything has gone as far as uh, granting the lawyer who would otherwise be under a mandatory obligation to report to have discretion to decide um, that in certain instances, uh, the best interest of the client would uh, require the lawyer not to report. But um, that's certainly something that could be explored. Well, I'll, I'll volunteer to take a look with the group. I will as well. So will I. There you go. Team 8.3. So um, is, is someone keeping track, Angela or others, about? Uh, no. Yes, I have William, Joel, Brandon, and Raquel. Did I miss anyone? Uh, Raquel's not on that. Oh, not on that. I'm sorry, Raquel. Yeah, no. oh, geez. Thank you. So, so Joel, Bill, and Brandon. So we have three three members currently. Is that right? 
Yes. Maybe. Um, okay. I can do. I. This is Cassidy. I can contribute. I've actually done some research on this in Illinois and Colorado and New York, and have advised some clients on this issue. So I can give you some of my memos that I've done. On Sounds great. So I just have a co some comments. Fine, Chair. Yes. Thanks, Raquel. Um, so I, I have to say I'm persuaded more positively by Randy's reframing of, <laughs> of 8.3 and some other elements. And I'm using reframing because I felt like that it was a reframe. I was uncomfortable with having an attorney be a mandated reporter. I just feel like that goes in all kinds of places um, that are not great, which some of you have said. Um, I also felt when it's tied to Girardi um, that it's, a, it's reactive. And I think as maybe Brandon said, I mean, there was, <laughs> there was more than adequate opportunity. So I felt like it's a shift in responsibility to put it on attorneys so it, it which i think is just not effective because i think i mean how are you really going to police that and so what happens is uh in some way the problem can get bigger because you're as a as an entity shifting it externally to another group of people um and so maybe whatever weaknesses you have in your internal processes, as Brandon said, if you don't look at that, they may stay or get worse because you're relying on some external people. Um, so that's my take. I think the frame Randy gave and um, gives us some other ways to look at it. I was appreciated. Um, Erica saying the expectation is to draft something even if at the end we say we don't, we're not recommending it, but here you go. Um, so that was helpful because I was thinking if we don't recommend it, we just don't write one. Um, but it seems like that's not an option. So that, that was helpful. All right. Well, thanks, Raquel, for your feedback on these. Um, and I, I, I believe we have a, a, a working group formed with with four members, so we can move on from from here. Um, and I, I, I really, I did also like Brandon your your suggestion. <laughs> um, I think there's a way we can try to, you know, come up with a proposal that, even though we don't ultimately agree with the rule, that that seems more. More realistic, I guess. I don't know the right word right now, but um, maybe we could. There's one more item on our agenda before we get to um, potential topics for new ethics opinion, and um, that involves public comments to the conversion clause opinion. Um, and I understand that we received a number of public comments, um, and Brandon, I think, can summarize them for the group and provide any anal initial analysis and recommendation that we can discuss. And then I believe we should table for our next meeting um, a revised draft if we feel that's um, required that to, to incorporate some of the public feedback. So Brandon, do you wanna start that discussion? Sure, sure. I will start and I meant before, to print this out. I'm sorry, before we go to 8.3, um, is it, feasible to ask for a push out of the time and ask a staff question? Because this seems, or maybe it's a hot button, but it seems more than a bread basket. And so if we assess at the beginning that we're gonna be pushed for time, could we, which I'm saying now, sounds like we will be, um, what would be the process to, to just say that and ask for a different date to report back to the, board 
Um, I can certainly raise that to the board chair. This is not, it's not written in a um, resolution or anything of that nature from the board of trustees. I mean, it was, it was a direction from the chair, but we could certainly perhaps raise that to them um, and go from there. I will add, um, just uh, as by way of background as to kind of the, the progress of these types of things once they are um, provided to the board of trustees that that assuming that it were to be provided at the, at the May meeting these these, these rules typically require um, at least two rounds of public comment at the board of trustees level. Um, so even assuming assuming that it was on this expedited schedule you're not looking at a uh, you know, and assuming a rule was, you know, proposed and, and voted out and the Supreme Court ultimately approved it, you're probably looking at, um, at a minimum, a one year process from, from start to finish. And I'd say that in the most, if that would be at the most efficient level of all of this. And just so I understand timing, um, so we have three meetings basically only where we can consider at the January, February and March meeting, because we can't, we won't have time I don't think we have a meeting on the date of the symposium. We just do the symposium in April. Is that right? So I, I do share Raquel's concerns, mainly all the three meetings seems like it might be sufficient. Unfortunately, with the, one of them being in January, I know that's going to be a tough meeting for everyone to come prepared for with the, the holidays around that time, you know, prior to that meeting. So I do think it, you know, given a lot of concerns the committee has with the role, it will require you know, an extensive analysis. So some more time would be useful. We'll, we'll do our best, but um, I just want to flag that issue too, because I think given this, as you mentioned, Erica, earlier the symposium and just given the holidays um, coming up, it might be difficult. Sure. It looks like just so you're aware, and this doesn't mean that it would be a appropriate topic for discussion because of the tight timeline, but it does look that the, the COPRAC does have a May 12th meeting that would predate the uh, board of trustees meeting, but it's you know only by a, a few very short days. So, yeah, and we'd have to get the stuff. Don't we have to usually get it like is it ten days prior to the board of trustee meeting? Where is the goal? That that is certainly the goal. So the based on the Bagley Keen requirements, um, the topic has to be provided to the public at least ten days in advance. And obviously, we we strive to have the materials provided at the same time, but that doesn't always occur. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, Brenda, did you want to talk now about the- Yes, yeah, sure. be happy to. I, I want to say at the outset, we got really, really thought-provoking public comment that will require an enormous amount of additional analysis and work because it should be taken very seriously. Um, and I'm happy to go through, I sort of just summarized in notes um, the public comment we received so I can just sort of raise the issues. And if anyone wants to speak on any of the issues, that's just fine. But I really do think this is going to be a situation where the drafting group's going to have to dig in and, and, and really wrestle with some stuff. I mean, not all the comments were um, as thought provoking as others, but I'll, I'll just start. The, the first public comment in the package was anonymous, which I thought was a little strange and wondered if it was a mistake because it was incredibly thorough and cogent in its analysis and its critique. Um, but the general theme for most of the comments that oppose the present, the, the interim draft, um, they feel that quantum merit is not sufficient to protect contingency attorney lawyers from bad actor clients, you know, sophisticated and bad faith clients who are uh, looking to harm or, or settle around or do things like that. Um, they also tend to feel that the opinion unfairly uh, singles out and targets, they use the word target often, uh, contingency fee attorneys while leaving hourly fee attorneys to run rampant. And I think that's a very interesting comment, which had never occurred to me as a contingency fee lawyer. I never thought of myself as targeting contingency fee lawyers. And there are plenty of opinions relating to the reasonableness of hourly rates that I do think constrain hourly uh, billing attorneys uh, the, from an ethical standpoint. Um, and that conversion clauses only appear in contingency agreements. Um, so I, I, I don't feel particularly struck by that one. 
but you know, it's a consistent theme that a lot of uh, organizations and individuals are voicing. So we should pay some uh, attention to it. Um, they, uh, many folks believe that a reasonable, they, there, there's an idea that conversion clauses should be assessed individually for reasonableness and that a reasonable conversion clause actually provides more transparency, transparency and certainty than a quantum Merowit analysis and uh, dispute. There is a sense that quantum Merowit provides no remedy in numerous bad faith circumstances. Uh, the anonymous commenter said, Coprac may think that contingent attorneys are required to take the risk of loss in such situations where you have a bad faith client tank a case, but that is a policy decision to be made by the legislature, not by ethical rules. I find that thought provoking. I don't believe I agree with it, but I want to dig deeper on that. You know, uh, um, so uh, the other comment is that the risk of a bad faith abandonment by a client is not within the scope of the risks that a contingent lawyer agrees to accept under the covenant of good faith and fair dealing, which applies both ways in an attorney fee uh, arrangement. There's a lot of belief that it's a double standard treating contingency fee lawyers more harshly than hourly fee lawyers. Um, and then the anonymous commenter gave many, many examples to prove his or her point that analysis of a contingent uh, of a conversion clause is much too factually specific for us to be opining generally on whether things are likely or unlikely to be ethically prohibited. Um, we point to no evidence or data to justify any fear of abuse by lawyers, which I also found interesting. I'm not aware of Koprak opinions generally doing statistical sort of overviews. I, I just know that from the working group on this opinion, I believe that all of us on the working group have seen substantial evidence in our careers of uh, abuse and overreach in the form of conversion clauses. Then um, another important theme and criticism is that if we, if we were to issue an opinion so restrictive of the use of conversion clauses, it would become an access to justice issue because convert, contingent fee attorneys are less likely than to agree to represent low-income clients on a contingency. We heard this this morning in the public comment from uh, Deborah Wolf, who spoke, and she actually submitted a comment separately, which I'll review in a moment. But she talked about the fact that uh, a lot of people who need legal work can't afford hourly fees, and therefore they need contingency representation. So you want to incentivize lawyers to take contingency representation and conversion clauses protect those lawyers so that they will undertake that work. My immediate response to that, and I want to consider it further, is that that's precisely why conversion clauses are so suspect and likely to be improper. If we operate from the proposition that there's a class of clients that cannot afford hourly rates, there should be nothing in their contingency agreement that's going to convert them to hourly rates, uh, especially if it's keyed off of um, what we view to be impermissible restriction or burdens on their unfettered right to terminate their counsel or their unfettered discretion in settlement. But I'll just keep going here because um, the next uh, notes I have are regarding the comment from the California Employment Lawyers Association. They oppose it um, for the same policy-based argument that uh, they are critical to protect contingent attorneys so that contingent attorneys will take contingent work, provide access to justice to people who can't afford hourly rates. In particular, they believe it will limit our opinion, if, if approved, would limit the availability of contingent lawyers in employment cases. Um, and then they were also troubled that we are targeting, targeting uh, conti uh, contingency counsel. Moving to the Consumer Attorneys of California, that's the, the organization for whom Deborah Wolf provided the opinion, and, and she spoke today. She believes that we are targeting contingency attorneys without identifying a problem. And I suppose if people believe that the draft is not explaining the nature of the problem, we can do a better job of explaining the nature of the problem because in the working group, we almost assume that as read. We've seen a lot of situations where people um, would have terminated their attorneys, but the threat of this large, immediately payable, hourly receivable was just an insurmountable obstacle. I'm not going to 
terminate my attorney because I can't, because I can't afford to, that sort of stuff. So we can, we can uh, give consideration to beefing up that portion. Um, the consumer or attorneys of California also believe this is an access to justice problem and that conversion clauses are necessary to protect attorneys from bad faith clients. Quantum Merowit is not sufficient protection. I want to I want to go down this analysis because I don't initially agree with that, but I want to look to this. Why would Quantum Merowit not be sufficient protection? Um, there were other useful comments. Uh, uh, consumer attorneys of California believe that the the sophistication of the client should be irrelevant to whether or not a conversion clause is ethically permissible. I'm not sure I agree because I think the sophistication of the client always goes to unconscionability. And that's one of the measures against we, which we uh, view or assess conversion clauses. Um, now the consumer attorneys of California believe that the helpful thing that we could do is to actually show the language that would make an acceptable conversion clause that is ethically permissible. Uh, if we move on to John Stephen Durant's comment, he's the co-chair of the legislation subcommittee of LACBA. He opposes. He says the opinion doesn't provide sufficient guidance on pre-dispute contractual mechanisms for uh, attorneys and clients. He's a lot of concern with opportunistic terminations of attorneys. He seems very comfortable with our opinion as it relates to the impermissibility of conversion clauses keyed off of settlement decisions, right? And he thinks that we must recognize that shrewd bad faith clients can and are exploiting the existing framework. And there should be a way to embed in a contingent fee contract a mechanism to fairly compensate an attorney who is terminated. Quantum merit is unfair and it's no solution at all. And you don't want to sue a client, which you have to do in quantum merit, even if you're 100% in the right. He believes that quantum merit fails to assess a proper risk premium and there should be a better approach. So this is interesting because those are his concerns. Again, I want to analyze that fairly because my sense has been, when you look at the Russ Miliband uh, line of cases that we cite in the opinion and, and the quantum Merowit framework that it is designed to and sufficiently does protect attorneys against bad faith gamesmanship by a client. Um, but of course it doesn't, if a client decides to abandon a case, it doesn't provide for a recovery to that attorney. There's a consistent theme among comments that oppose the opinion that that is not among the risks that a contingent attorney undertakes. I have always squarely thought it is exactly among the risks a contingent attorney takes. You have a real conversation with your attorney, uh, with your client at the outset. Are you going to see this thing through to conclusion? And if you're not, I don't want the case. But, and you'd still run a risk. You could you could get thrown under the bus. I always thought that was part of the risk and the risk premium, but we have to look at that because we're seeing it in a lot of these a lot of these comments. Um, there was another public comment from Bruce he uh, Hyman who proposes, who opposes. And this was really interesting because we didn't address this squarely. He believes that as presently worded, our draft would adversely affect the attorney's ownership right in statutory of fees awarded in discrimination and public rights cases, okay? Thereby, again, worsening access to justice, that, that attorney's fees awards in such cases belong per case law to the attorney. And defendants routinely in such cases offer settlement to the client in exchange for a waiver of those attorney's fees awards. But the client doesn't own the award. To me, this is a situation I have not considered before. It's a situation rife with spectacular conflict, and we have to give it some analysis, okay? Um, I don't, as he frames the issue, I don't arrive at the same conclusion he does at all initially, but I, we did not address this, and I want to take a look at it. Um, and, and he has some other helpful comments and nits we should take a look at. Moving on to PREC, uh, LACBO's Professional Responsibility and Ethics Committee. This is really interesting because standing in stark contrast to every other comment I've just described, they appear to very much strongly support this opinion, except that they don't believe it goes far enough and that the language is too mushy. Take a stronger stand, not likely to be unethical. These things per our analysis are unethical, okay? And if we think that um, uh, scenarios one and two are not permissible, 
just say they are not ethically permissible. They talk, they, they take the analysis of our opinion a couple more steps, which I actually found pretty persuasive as well. They say, if we look at Fracassi and we look at the Scapa Brown uh, uh, opinion, both of which are discussed in our draft, I apologize, I need to move because my computer's running out of batteries, um, both of which are discussed in our draft. Those lead to the, or potentially, you know, they don't, they're not telling us how to do our job, but they say those appear to lead to the logical conclusion that conversion clauses are intended to evade the definitive uh, holding of Fracassi, which is that you can't get in a contingency agreement, you can't get um, any payment until the contingency occurs. And then it's a quantum merit analysis. That's the law. And if we're trying, if a conversion clause is designed to evade that, it is ethically prohibited. Similarly, as to the Scapa Brown arrangement, where there's a minimum fee that infringes on the settlement uh, discretion of the client. So LACBA appears to be saying, um, you're almost there. All your logic leads to saying that these conversion clauses are not ethical. Take the step, finish, close the loop, or explain what you mean, how is it possible that they're ever... And then they found our fifth scenario, which was the only one where we thought it was potentially permissible. They said, that's kind of ridiculous and far-fetched and not useful. And and uh, they don't think uh, we should be in the business of trying to come up with convoluted scenario. Look, I'm grossly paraphrasing very well-written comments, but that we shouldn't be in the business of coming up with sort of absurd hypotheticals to allow a glimmer of sunlight on something that is ethically impermissible. Um, we, was, we got another opposition from an attorney named Anthony, Anthony Lewis, um, who believes that, uh, again, raised this issue of the attorney's ownership in statutory fee awards. Our, our opinion does not address that, and I understand. Uh, we should probably wrestle with this issue um, because we're, we're silent on it. Um, uh, Mr. Lewis uh, says, uh, quantum merit's not a realistic option. Questions whether we even understand how a quasi-contract quantum merit analysis works. They don't think we do understand it. Um, conversion clauses are necessary to protect client, uh, attorneys from unscrupulous, unscrupulous clients. And um, he now, Mr. Lewis makes a really interesting point, I just thought from a logical point of view that we fail to consider that <clears throat> the converted hourly terms would be perfectly acceptable if you just threw out an hourly agreement and didn't start out as a contingency agreement. And that's true. And But the problem is also this whole, the, the understanding under which you undertake the representation. We mentioned people that advertise, you don't pay unless we collect. Well, that's not consistent with a conversion clause. And um, the access to justice issue is huge too. Because if there is a class of clientele that cannot afford hourly fees, that need contingent attorneys, and undertake contingent representation, um, any conversion to hourly fees that we are assuming they cannot afford suddenly takes all these uh, client rights and transfers them to the attorney in how the representation proceeds. These are things we should look at further and more deeply. I am not persuaded, but I do find them to be interesting points. The Orange County Bar Association supports our opinion if modified, doesn't, this is really interesting because uh, one of the things that we did differently in this draft was instead of saying, here's our scenario facts, and then we talked for six pages and then here's our analysis, we put our facts and analysis together, which we tended to think was uh, easier to follow. And the OCBA doesn't like it, wants us to revert to the traditional COPRAC method of splitting those things up. Um, they think that uh, our footnotes saying that we are not opining on the legal enforceability, just the ethical, you know, the ethical um, uh, merits is confusing and what could possibly be the difference and we should explain that. I, I thought we were putting those footnotes in because we don't opine as to issues of law. So I, we should think about that carefully. Um, they actually want additional sites in our scenario two to the Russ Miliband cases. That's fine with me. Uh, we talk about them. They know that they note that we talk about that earlier, but they say it really governs scenario two. They propose some simpler ways to structure our analysis for, scenario, for scenarios one through three. And then they make a comment when we use the term that conversion clauses can penalize a client for the discharge of a lawyer, 
they note that in contract law, a penalty is determined by the reasonable endeavor test, which they describe. And they want us to clarify whether we're using the term penalty to incorporate that standard or to have a broader meaning. Then that's a fair point we should clarify. So those are my crib notes as to these voluminous comments we got. It's a lot for the working group to wrestle with. And I think some of it's very useful. Some of it I do not find persuasive, but um, I think it's all worthy of us digging in more deeply and, and seeing what applies. So that's my uh, spiel on um, the public comment for the conversion clause opinion. Now, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to go back to the woodshed and look through some of this stuff. I do agree that we did ignore the statutory fee issue and uh, that may be worth taking a look at. But the thing that I don't understand, I've never understood the access to justice argument. I mean, I can't drive from here to Los Angeles without by the time I get to Covina seeing 200 signs for call Jacob or Larry H. Parker or anybody else willing to take a contingent fee case. As far as, well, uh, opportunistic or bad faith clients. If I have an absolute right to fire my lawyer, I can do that whether it's good faith, bad faith, or opportunistic or any other reason. It's my right. And so they're complaining about something that is in the law. It's not something that targets them because you can fire your attorney at any time. And if I'm an hourly lawyer and I think I get a big case that's going to make me a $4 million fee, and I get fired two days in and I can't, you know, finish the case and collect that fee. That's my tough luck, too. So I don't Joel, think Joel, just to interrupt really quickly. Some of them talk about this whole settling around the attorney or settling at the courthouse steps. I, I, there's plenty of attorney lien mechanisms and quantum merit analysis that I think accounts for that. I have yet to see a scenario that doesn't. Yeah, but the, I mean, also, too, the, the one thing that I never hear discussed on the other side is one of the very first cases I testified in was a, a contingent fee case where it was a hugely risky case uh, with very low likelihood of success and recovery. But the attorney essentially wrote two letters and the defense caved and they recovered $2 million against a 25% contingent fee and the client objected. And the lawyer said, yeah, you know, you only wrote two letters. And the client, uh, the lawyer said, well, wait, I got the result. I took the risk. And nobody ever says, you know, hey, if I, if I do less than I thought I was going to do to recover that fee, which I knew was going to be more than the hourly, I should right. refund it to reasonable value. So, right. and, and that's the nature of the business. And I think what they're talking about is, is just something that's part of the nature of the business. But I, I'll, I'll climb on the bandwagon and I'll go back and take a look with you. I did look at those comments and I wasn't persuaded uh, at all, but let's grind it through. Yes. Hey, yes. hey Brandon. So in terms of the, um, the uh, statutory fee issue, and I assume it's based on the fact that, okay, you're in a fee hot claim. And, and so you have the right to recover fees uh, and the client fires the lawyer for whatever reason, uh, you know, midstream. And then the client then proceeds through the litigation, goes to trial, wins, and is awarded all the attorney's fees that have been incurred. And that's the scenario you're envisioning. Is that is no, that no, no. That to me, uh, Bill, that sounds like a realistic scenario. The scenario that actually came up, I think, in two of these comments is the idea that, say, an employment or civil rights case. Right. Somebody, uh, the the client um, um, wants reinstatement. The attorney works really hard for several years and believes he or she is entitled to some huge statutory fee award, which has not yet been awarded. Okay, but they are already in these in these comments viewing that as the lawyer's property, and then so the settlement offer kind of says, "Well, we'll give you your old job back, uh, but you got to waive everything else." And these comments are saying, well, the client has a no right to waive the attorney's fees. I'm not sure that's correct at all. Yeah. I, the client I can know. always settle his or her case, just boom. Right. And, and if the attorney views 
him or herself as having an ownership interest in the case that gives the attorney rights to determine settlement. I think that's likely just wrong and a massive conflict issue, but I want to dig deeper. I haven't looked at it. It just strikes me as that's not, it, until the fees are awarded, they don't belong, they don't exist, they don't belong to anyone, right? Right. And yeah. I do think that is a big risk. And I do see it as an access to justice. Sure. If uh, if a client can abandon his or her case after you've done a ton of work and then there's no contingency and no fee and no statutory award, uh, you got screwed. Um, I view that as a cost of doing business. I really, I don't know. I mean, the alternative is not, the answer is not to give the lawyer the, the settlement decision-making authority over the client's case. But but I want to look at it more carefully just because I haven't hadn't thought of this particular issue until these comments. Because it's interesting because, you know, under the Flannery case, it's, you know, absent an agreement between the parties that any statutory fees awarded are the lawyers. But, but what if there in are your situation, no... You, you, haven't, you haven't been awarded a fee. Right. So this really, right. so can a lawyer say, no, 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 you can't settle this case because I'm going to win and I'm going to get those statutory fees, which are mine. Right. If that were true, that's like a massive conflict throughout the whole representation, right? Sure. All the client just, wants back is his or her job or, or something. I don't know. Anyhow, it's, it's very interesting. In the comments, some of them were talking about the situation where, where there is a statutory fee award and the, you know, the defense says, you know, we'll settle, but you got to waive the fee, the statutory fee. And that's what the, some of the comments were talking about. That was addressed in a Coprac opinion 20 years ago. Oh, is that right? Yeah, the one where, you know, the, uh, if I recall the, that issue, uh, the number I don't remember, but it was, the conclusion was, the question was, if the lawyer is presented with a settlement proposal that's contingent on the statutory fee being waived, do they even have to communicate that to the client? <laughs> Oh, interesting. And the answer was yes, yes. even though, it, you know, you might lose, you know, the end result might be that you're going to lose your statutory fee. So wow. that, that, that rule has been around and, uh, you know, it was over 20 years ago. I would say it was in the late eighties that that opinion came out. Well, a lot of these comments want to protect the attorney against that result. I understand all the motivations here and it's not necessarily bad faith. I just don't think it's, permissible at first blush there is you know i mean some there is some stuff about there about assigning them you know and giving the attorney some you know greater rights in the statutory fee but most of those uh if i'm unless i'm mistaken say you know if you if you do that to the extent it's ethically permissible you're triggering 1.8.1 and then you'll have to deal with that and that was absent in all of these comments yeah. and, and you touched on a point that caught me too is you know none of these comments uh, address the fact that there's a lien, right? Isn't that the protection? Contingent fee cases, you have the lien. So once the case settles and the contingency occurs, the attorney's lien has to be dealt with, and usually it's dealt with you know under a quantum merit analysis, but. It's not like you necessarily have to go file a separate lawsuit to collect your fee. Your lien claim has to be dealt with at the time of settlement. And that's generally how it's dealt with on the quantum Merowit analysis. So, yeah, no, I agree. It seemed like a lot of these were trying to take the contingency the, out of contingency. You know, they're, right. They're going to, you know, they're going to get paid, you know, pretty much no matter what happens. So, well, I and I also I, I agree. We we ought to, we we need to part. They they were pretty substantial comments. I agree. They really the, one, the anonymous one was fascinating. I mean, that thing was like 12, 13 pages long. I've never seen a lawyer do so much hard work and analysis without putting a name on it. Yeah. Um, but I I also found it fascinating that Prec, I figured it was you, but no. <laughs> I th I thought it was really interesting that Prec um wanted us to go further, sort of shut the door. I I that was my read of it. And uh, which was, you know, that's a, there's a lot of attorneys on PREC and to, for them to uh, agree to send that comment letter surprised me. So. Yeah, well, From the I, subcommittee I, standpoint, I, would, I do want to say, uh, you know, some of the comments that I, I really did agree with was, 
there were several comments that that fifth scenario was ridiculous because you know it was, it was so uh, you know out there and so unlikely to happen and that is the subcommittee that was our conclusion yeah you know brandon as you know i'm i'm would fall with the lacma group i think we didn't go far enough uh, yeah and i also agree that i don't think scenario five is is worth including or should be included i don't want to encourage people to start thinking about ways to get around it but um you know, the, the whole concept of a bad faith client or an opportunistic client, well, how far do you go? What about the, the bad faith defendant who loses and declares bankruptcy? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You don't recover. That's yeah. the risk. That's the risk. That's why the fee structure is set the, is set the way it is. And access to justice. That fee structure is what gets you an attorney where, you know, any other attorney who looks at a case with a, a significant risk of loss is going to have to advise the client, um, are you really going to invest $100,000 to recover $50,000 and have a 5% chance of doing it? I mean, you know, there's, there's all those things. That's what the whole, I mean, for a century, <laughs> Contingent fees have been structured that way so that the attorneys who practice in that area get the high side and they have to put up with the risk to yeah. justify the cases where they get the high side. And, you know, uh, I guess not. Well, I've handled a few contingent fee cases and um, I've won some and I've lost some and I appreciate it. I'm glad I don't. Pra I didn't practice in that area all the time because I don't know if I could have taken that that um, volume and you know all that sort of stuff. But that's just part of it. And I don't know. Maybe we do need to do a better job of communicating why it is that these what they say are risks or penalties or whatever for the lawyers or lack of protection for the lawyers are justified because they have the upside. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, I've been a contingency lawyer for 20 years and I've had great clients. I've had good results, bad results, but I've had challenging clients too. And it may, it's not a pleasant situation. There's no seamless way to have a, a, a bad faith client, but it is what the attorney's lien is for. And it's ugly and it's difficult, but it is a form of protection. So, I just found the, the opinion I was thinking about. It's nineteen eighty nine dash one one four. Okay. So By the way, that's that's over thirty years ago, not twenty years. Ago. <laughs> that's why I'm a lawyer. My math skills. <laughs> well, we're well, we're talking said... about Ken Bacon time, not <laughs> real time. But anyway. So I guess, Brandon, then we go back to the drawing board. You're going to set something up for us? Yeah, yeah. I think we should just talk through some of these things and see how it impacts what we've worked on and what is worth re revisiting or changing, if anything. So, And then we present that to the committee and see what everyone else thinks. How many comments did you get, Brandon? Uh, just, I don't know. Just generally, what? not. you don't have to be precise. Well, it was like 10, whatever I read, like eight. It was like, yeah, it was, it was oh, at, okay. least, at least 10 or more. It was the, the length of some of them that was unusual. Yeah, I mean, there were some really analysis-filled comments. Yeah, but also, Raquel, that's a little misleading because uh, a number of those comments were on behalf of associations or groups. So right. yeah. you, can't, you can't judge the volume just because, by that number. Right. Like I think the PREC ethics committee has like 40 attorneys on it. So 35, I don't know, it's huge. Okay, thank you. Sure. Are we able to circulate those public comments prior to the next meeting? Cause I don't think um, they were on the agenda for this meeting, the agenda part we'll of the, the SharePoint. <laughs> I've already uploaded them. To the oh yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, but, they, yeah, they'll be posted as part of the agenda materials for the January meeting. Um, so that's how the, full committee should should read them. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, well, Brandon and others, did you have anything else you want to talk about relating to the public comments? 
I don't think so. I think they're really useful. I think they'll make the opinion more robust, however we settle on our reactions to them. And uh, it'll just be some more digging and, and we'll, we'll work through it and report back. Okay, sounds good. Um, and it looks like we might conclude early today because the last item on the agenda is consideration of um, new ethics opinions. And as I was going through um, what's kind of part of our agenda materials, I think we've gone over this list so many times and I, I, I apologize to the new, to the new members. I, I know we haven't gone over it with you, so maybe it's worthwhile to, to briefly go over it again. But I also feel that what would be most useful is if, it, if other members, including the new members, have any suggestions um, on issues that you feel are important for an ethics opinion um, that, that you think COPRAC should address, we should discuss that too. We're not, you know, these are just ideas part of this list, but it, some of them, um, you know, I think because you've considered them in the past over several meetings and elected not to pursue them, we likely won't um, unless others feel feel strongly that, that we should, but we welcome new ideas. So if others have new ideas, that would be great. And I know Justin at, I think a meeting, like, uh, I don't know how long ago it was, two or three meetings past has suggested you didn't have a pre precise topic, but something um, dealing with ethical issues um, relating to um, disabilities. You had mentioned the extraordinary attorney Wu on Netflix show, which I have since watched. I, I got addicted to it. It was wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm glad you got something out of Coprac other than ethics. <laughs> yeah, so I, I recommend the extraordinary attorney Wu if others haven't seen it. Um, but it, I, I welcome, we welcome suggestions. So if we want to start, maybe, I don't know where the right place, um, Angela, to start on this list is. Um, some of these we've actually, the ones Sarah, that- Maybe Sarah, could you give some context? How does, um, just how does something get on either the, not gonna what do you call it decline to opine and yes we will and then sure because once it's on the one you have up you know is it just by date by what's the what's the framework and so, how, you know, some of these are a long time ago so why haven't so, they? someone can correct me if, if, if i'm wrong but my understanding is so it's just going fr from square one so initially, I think these opinion ideas were came from many different sources. They could have been suggested by members of the public, other bar associations, or COPRAC members, both current or, or prior um, COPRAC members, and as suggestions for issues we consider. And we've just we've gone over this list um, at multiple COPRAC meetings, and at those meetings, the, the members either voted, okay, let's, this isn't an appropriate um, topic or, or, or that we should pursue further, or let's hold this and consider it later, or um, some of them we just haven't reached a decision on at all. Um, but basically that's my understanding of the process. Um, but if, if others have more insight to add, if I'm missing something, let me know. Okay, Sarah, I just wanted to remind you, uh, at the next meeting, I'd like to come back with the uh, two advisory ones we've discussed, contract and uh, breach of fiduciary duty, uh, how you handle those. So I'll be back to the you at the next agenda deadline. Yes, I understand. Thanks, Joel. Okay. So, Sarah, how... Okay, so like the first one is you know, 2019. So how do we, I mean, it seems like we either want to do something or get it off the list. Well, oh, I'm, well, I'm just, I don't know, one, whatever you had on, uh, actually the first two now have 2019 on. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand, we have a long list of things that we're not taking actions on. At the same time, we're adding new stuff which I'm trying to reconcile, why are we doing that? 
So that, that's- I think the ones we've, if I'm right, and I, I, I can't see the full screen now, but, but I, I think we've taken off the ones we've voted not to consider further. And then the ones that remain are ones that we just haven't evaluated, but, the, but I'm sure this, this should be narrowed as you suggested, Raquel, and there, there's stuff that we just don't wanna take up given the passage of time. Um, but I don't know that we wanna spend the time one by one. I don't know how long the list is. I thought maybe we'd start with the, the top and if there's ones that we can go over some of the more recent ones and then uh, to decide yeah. if we wanna pursue, if not vote, vote to take them off. If I'm reading correctly, the heading above that is those are ones we decline to opine on. Oh yeah, so this one, I don't think we should go over the decline to opine list. Yeah. The I other one. Right the other ones. There. There's a yeah. page before that. Yeah, there's a bunch of them, and they just say hope for consideration. Yeah, there's oh. more there. So, right? just so, so you hope. know, what had happened was, yes, they were presented at a past meeting, yeah, and right. at that time, the, the, the group at that time decided, we like the idea, but either one, there was not enough authority, two, there were other issues that uh, topics they wanted to take up first and they decided, you know what, this would be good for the future, let's just leave it on the list. And so it stays there until someone thinks that either one, usually decline to opine means they're asking for um, an opinion on, let's say, um, uh, what is it that we usually don't comment on? Um, you have law maybe? Or unauthorized practice of law type stuff then that's for sure goes on the decline to opine list. Yeah, there's certain things that we'll decide, no, that's not for us to be opining on. Maybe it's not ethics related, or you know, there's not enough um, authorities out there because it might be too cutting edge. In that case, we'll either leave it on the list or we'll decline to opine. So these are things in the past that they just said, you know, we like it. There are, there is enough authorities out there that we could write something, but is there something else that interests us more? And then it also depends on whether someone volunteered to take it up and start drafting it. On that list, if you go down to the next one, number two, that's in progress. We've already, Joel's working on that. Or... Right. And so that one, and for that one, you should ask, actually write disposition um, in progress, or we should write down what meeting date we decided to take that up. So we have a record of when it was initially started. Yeah, well, I think we're doing it more in terms of an updated advisory as opposed to an ethics opinion. But. Right, but it, it yes, so that actually should come off the list. I think there was a there might have been two actually from the last time we had our we we looked at these. Yeah, I think the next one, Cassidy, aren't you working on the next one too? Yeah, I was just I was just gonna say that's the outline that Joel and I worked on, and we'll get back to once we can. <laughs> in progress is correct. And on the next page, 10AAA, that was actually me who brought that one up, not staff. And after looking at it, I decided that there wasn't really anything there worth pursuing. Well, in that case, if the committee agrees, we can just delete it. We don't need to send you a decline no pine letter. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the general consensus is I brought it up. Did I think there was anything there? And then when I said there wasn't, we, we dropped that. So, then 103 is in progress. That's basically the cryptocurrency one. Very similar, at least. <clears throat> I think that was actually requested by two different people, and maybe the other one definitely did come off the list. <laughs> But yes, that one can come off. It's no longer, yeah, and you can delete hold for con future consideration. I like this one. <laughs> um. Can you scroll up a little? Where is it? Oh. Anyway, I, yeah, I, I, I think an, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know the ethics opinions on, on um, privilege and trust and, you know, the owner of the privilege um, 
transferring owner of privilege from trustee to successor trustee. And I, don't, I feel like there is already an ethics opinion on that. Is there, or is it just Mueller? But I always get questions about that, so. Yeah, I'm not aware of ethics opinions on it. I, I thought it was just the case law, but I, I'm, I could be wrong. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to take it on. I'm just saying it's an interesting topic. <laughs> no, at least not at this point. You could roll the next one into your in-house counsel. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say the next one is is basically, except for the, the first question is the second one is not. But I didn't even see the, the Chisholm case in here before. That's funny. So this one can be in progress, right? Yeah, why don't you, Ann, just put um, in progress and then put the, which one is it? 21003. Okay. I think this um, overhead charge, isn't that addressed in already in an ethics opinion, item 107, maybe Ken, I, I thought you were, you, you might know the answer to that. Well, it's we do dealt with the show within the cost design. advisor, yeah. The mechanism of like overhead charges and written paper is not related. Uh, well, there's a, well, the ABA opinion, I know directly addresses that. And we dealt with that in the cost advisory yeah, I want to say there's. I have to go back on the line. I, I want to say there was something in California above and beyond the ABA or similar to the ABA opinion, but I could be mistaken. So should we remove this from the list since it's all? It seems like it's already adequately addressed. That would be my recommendation. Uh, I think it's a okay if the mechanism for insurance is not related. You may want to look at the actual letter that came requesting this opinion. It might help you determine whether it's something that has been addressed or whether we can just reply back and says we're declining to opine because an existing opinion already has been published. And that might help, yeah, because it sounds like what they're saying is. Because the ABA opinion says it's got to be tied to your actual cost. You can't use it as a profit center. So it sounds like they're asking if you can. The thing is, he already recognizes in his letter the ABA opinion, ABA opinion 93379. He's oh, okay. looked at some of the other opinion. I think you guys should just leave. I don't know why he thinks it's not adequately addressed in the opinion. But if well, you want, I can circulate this. Uh, request letter and then maybe at the next meeting we can decide whether to take it off the list or to respond back that it's been adequately answered. Well, Mimi, Mimi, if you're going to do that, circulate with it the uh, cost advisory because I know we debated that we have about two or three paragraphs talking about when it could be justified and concluded that it's a more of a um, uh, uh, a contractual issue, not an ethical issue bounded only by the um, unconscionability standard at the high end. And so if we're going to look at what they want us to respond to, let's take a look at what we've already done and see if we've already done the job with that advisory. OK, which advisory are you referring to? That's oh, the, gosh, the, it was passed just when I came yeah. on the committee. It's the, uh, the last one then. It's, it's the last fee arbitration advisory okay. on handling costs. Got it. Sure. Also, I'll circulate that with the request letter and then we can take a look at that. I'll circulate it with the uh, assignment agenda materials. So we'll get it all put together. Thanks, Mimi. The next one, proposed rule change for 7.2, that's kind of vague. <laughs> Is there more to it than that? Or I assume there's a letter or something? 
um, hold on. Oh, uh, which, sorry, which one are we looking at? Number 108 there, the one right below. The yes, that I believe was a request from an attorney. Hold on, let me find it. Let's see if I can find it. I believe, is it this one? Yes, we got a, it was just a short email that wanted us to consider a proposed change to 7.2. If you want, I can go ahead and circulate that as well. Yeah, I just can't tell what, it, you know, from that, uh, what, what they're even talking about. But. Hold on, he is. Although Erica, you responded to this attorney thinking that that his concern or her concerns were already addressed in the current rules. I, I did, and then we received additional follow-up correspondence. Okay. Indicating. Well, they, they circulate this as well. Yeah, they provided feedback. They provided a request for amendments to the former rule, and I provided language in the current rule that I thought might address their concerns, but the okay. concerns have not been addressed. I will circulate both. Okay. So I'm thinking that maybe um, what we should do is, I don't know that everyone's had a chance to look at carefully these opinions, but I, but I think maybe if we could try to look at them more closely, including the two letters that Mimi's going to forward um, in advance of our next meeting, and then decide if, if we want to pursue any of these recent um, opinion suggestions or requests. Um, but aside from what's on, on the screen, does, do any members have suggestions for, for ethics opinions that you think COPRAC should consider or that you'd, be, you'd want to work on, even if it's on the, on the screen currently? Uh, not necessarily ethics opinions, but on the advisories when we were going through the uh, 1993-02 update, you know, became apparent we need to update the I think forget it, I think it's like 201202 handling legal malpractice claims to uh, address the Shepherd Mullen case because it predated Shepherd Mullen. Yeah, Ken, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that on. I'll come out, I'll give you two drafts by the next deadline, both on the uh, interpreting the contract. Or what the contract standard is, and then what is the Shepard Mullen standard? Uh, revising the earlier contract advisory and then revising the malpractice and fiduciary duty breaches uh, advisory. So those, I'm going to come back. Oh, I, gee, I promise. Well, maybe I'm lying, but I'm going to try uh, by the next meeting. Okay. The one on mediation confidentiality, I'm not quite sure how we would, because I think the uh, disclosure kind of deals with that to some extent, the, the required disclosure, but it's something that pops up very frequently. I mean, I've got an extra witness case I'm working on now where, you know, court made a ruling on that already. So, I'm not sure how we would deal with it in an ethics opinion, but it's kind of an ongoing issue. I guess the one on that same point, Ken, I've asked to do a, an article on when lawyers make misrepresentations in mediation. You know, there's a there's a prior COPRAC opinion that talks about, you know, for instance, if you say the policy limits are 200,000 and the case settles for the 200,000 policy limits when in fact there are a million, you know, is that, can that information be used to set aside that settlement? I mean, that prior COPRAC opinion just talks about whether or not that's a uh, intentional misrepresentation that would violate the rules. My question goes a little farther. Assume that's the case. Does the mediation confidentiality preclude any evidence in a, in a state bar proceeding that would be used against that lawyer for making the misrepresentation? 
I, it may not apply here for COPRAC purposes, but it's an inter interesting issue. Uh, I don't know. I mean, my, my, my thought is that it, it, it would prevent that, it, that evidence coming into the state bar proceeding because it's not, I mean, it's, it's not a criminal matter uh, which they carve the exceptions out for, you know, that one earlier case talks about a juvenile dependency proceeding. There'd be some constitutional issue where you they have to be able to present a defense, but, you know, a state bar disciplinary proceeding is, is not criminal in nature. And therefore, if that's the case, then the mediation confidentiality would preclude that evidence in the state bar proceeding. I don't know. That's just my thoughts, but I, it's kind of far in a field from what you're saying, but I just... Uh, it's an interesting issue. <clears throat> yeah, you know, the I would like to see somebody else, not me, take on that the media, you know, the, the Comden case and all that and and how far that privilege goes. Um, at first, I thought it was it was ridiculous. But then as the more I got into it, I realized there's considerations of the confidentiality that everybody participating in the mediation uh, has a right to expect, including the opposing sides, et cetera. And so if you can use that information to uh, sue your attorney or uh, make a uh, state bar complaint, disciplinary complaint against your attorney involving information that's covered by that privilege, uh, there's some justification for it. So I would sit back and enjoy someone else looking at that, but. I'm not going to do it. I'm not volunteering at the moment either. I just thought it was an interesting issue. But... So should we not add it if nobody wants to take it on? I'm sorry, what was that? I said, since no one wants to take it on, should we not add it? Add it to, to a list that has no owner. <laughs> I mean, we could always leave it on there for future consideration for somebody to volunteer and take it on. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and add it, Ange, as a topic, and then maybe somebody eventually will take it up on time, or if we decide later to take it off, because there's not enough there, but I think there is plenty. Okay, how do you want me to summarize the topic? Joel, can you provide her some language, please? What was that? Could you just how summarize you... what the proposed opinion you just mentioned, Joel? Oh, the, uh, the scope of the, the mediation privilege and um, uh, what use can be made of, of information that only comes from a mediation in other proceedings, such as a state bar complaint. It's in there now under nine, with two A's next to it, how to handle mediation confidentiality, the Cassell case. Is there, are there um, disciplinary rules involved or uh, Rules of professional conduct involved, or is it just an evidentiary pr privilege? I mean, are we are we allowed to address that issue in an ethics opinion if it has nothing to do with ethics, it, but really it, evidence? It, it does. I mean, it, it, you talk about truthfulness to others, um, well, yeah. those type of rules. I mean, that, that those are the rules that I came across when I'm in doing this article. It's it's that it's eight point four eight point four D, I think. Well, but that's um, well, but mediation privilege is its own thing. I mean, you can, you know, the right. I have, I have a hard time seeing well, that, that. That 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 that's been my my struggle is. I was asked to do an article on that issue, and you know, some practice pointers, and you know, my conclusion is none of that stuff comes into a state bar proceeding. <laughs> but I mean, that's my initial impression. But right, not so with, like, notwithstanding a rule violation. Yeah, yeah. So right. So the question. So the question is, is what? Yeah. So the question is, is if you if if there's violations of of um you know eight point four or well eight point four and um and 
and 4.2 and you know all of the the communication misrepresentation rules does it matter if it's covered you know by mediation privilege do you get is there any recourse so i guess that's the kind of the question yeah, I, I guess the only way you could get around that is if it was information independently obtained outside of the mediation yeah. obviously yeah that would be the only way to do it yeah i mean it's even actionable yeah. you know as fraud you know right. and so before before I would waste any time with it. I would check with the OTC and see if in their training materials for um, state bar prosecutors, they've covered that, what to do with that kind of evidence. Well, uh, they ask for it, that's for sure. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, and I've, I've dealt with it in, in responding to inquiries, um, but I haven't really, there hasn't been a, been a whole lot of debate over it, you know. So, <clears throat> but it's an interesting question. I agree. Changing topics from the um, proposed new ethics opinions, and I, I don't think we're, it seems like right now, I, I think everyone's pretty busy and doesn't want to necessarily volunteer or have suggestions for an opinion that they're really feeling confident that they want to work on at the moment. The other topic that I wanted to raise, and it was discussed at the beginning of our meeting, was just the upcoming ethics symposium. Because I think we really, since it's going to be in April, uh, we should come very prepared for the January meeting um, on potential topics for the ethics symposium. I'm not saying we need to necessarily brainstorm now. We can do some more at the next meeting. But I just, between the next meetings, if that can be something that everyone thinks about. Um, and Mimi, maybe you already mentioned this and I, I apologize at the beginning, but are, is that something that you're, you're going to be able to circulate ahead of time just to kind of the, how it works? I know you've done that before. Well, well the, not the how it works, we usually talk about at the meeting. What I will provide you is basically a list of historically either topics that we've considered in the past, but did yeah. not take up kind of like this. Um, topics that we have taken up and it'll tell you what year, who are possible, who are speakers at that time when they did a small blurb about what they covered in their course. And then that'll help us. Sometimes we'll have an idea. And it's like, well, you know, I think we talked, we, we had a program on that like four years back. So it might be too soon or be like, oh, you know, it turns out the last time somebody did a panel on this topic was like 20 years ago. This might be a good time to ch um, do another, you know, uh, a, a newer version of it since the rule has changed since then or there's been new case law and so those type of things. I mean, I guess we can go through it real quick, just let um, the new members know that basically the ethics symposium is held in April and there are four panels typically. Um, they are The first panel is usually a leadership panel, which usually involves the chair, the vice chair and the advisor. The second, third and fourth panels are usually moderated by a senior member of the committee. And the people we usually have on our ethics symposium panels are usually brought from the outside. They're usually um, specialists um, in that area of, of law or, you know, maybe sometimes it'll be professors, sometimes it'll be um, district attorneys, depends on what the topic is, but we usually bring outside people. And all members are obviously welcome to attend. Um, and so what we do is together that we do decide which topics uh, would be, you know, which topics that we should take up. So we'll, we'll, We'll have a list, we'll discuss it, and then we usually just vote on it. We just take a straw poll and see which topics people would be interested in, and we assign out who will be the moderator for that panel. Hey, since it's evidently been at least 30 years, let's do statutory fees. And I, I also forget, is it, well, this one, I remember I, I saw some email that it's gonna be virtual, but I thought there was some discussion about it being hybrid potentially, do we know? I think the plan was to hold it hybrid but if we did that it would have to be held in los angeles oh, okay i think if it was usually every other year we would switch one year and be in san francisco one year and be in los angeles right now i think when it comes to having a zoom room a room where we can have it in person as well as hold it virtually via zoom LA is the only one that has a conference room large enough and has the ability to um, spotlight whoever's speaking at the moment. So if we do hold it in person, decided to go the hybrid route, it will have to be in Los Angeles. Okay. One, 
one feedback I got from last year's seminar was I think one of the most appreciated sections was where we just talked about what we're working on. Um, I can't remember if that was in the leadership part yeah. or separate from it, but uh, the, the positive comments I got was, hey, that's nice to know what you're working on. And I was just uh, doing some of my filing. I got the new pages for my CEB fee agreement forms manual. And I noticed in their recent development section, they talked about what Coprac was doing uh, from our agenda on our stuff about fees. So people are paying attention to that. So please keep that on the list. Um, I would also like to point out that Coprax Ethics Symposium isn't like your typical MCLE day. It's uh, we look for not just regular, general, like basic law practice management, how to write a fee agreement, those kind of things. They tend to be more cutting edge topics, um, topics you know based on new case law that has come out, or you know, I don't know. Many many years ago, there was like um, attorney rating sites, you know, or social networking, because at that time that was kind of a new thing, you know, um, using social networking to find clients and start, you know, uh, attorney client relationships by, you know, over the computer instead of meeting a client in person and those kind of things. At that time, it was considered cutting edge. So we're always looking for topics that are kind of new or that bring in a lot of interest that probably maybe not haven't even been done before. Um, when we're, so keep that in mind when you're thinking of topics to suggest, and that'd be really helpful. Okay, so I think, um, was there anything else that members wanted to talk about relating to the symposium? I think we'll get into more of a discussion at our next meeting. I just wanted to flag the issue so people start thinking about it and come to the next meeting prepared. But um, I think if there's no other issues, we could probably conclude the meeting, but I'll, I'll pause to open it up for discussion. Uh, Raquel, I think has her hand raised, but I was just gonna oh, add that, that, that we wanna talk about a uh, committee topic for uh, new member topic assignments or opinion assignments. I think that was on there as well. Yes, uh, that was on there. I think right now, um, yeah, I, I forget. Our new members, Dan, I know you're on, I forget which one, uh, the in-house The, the in-house one. Yeah. yeah, and Raquel, are you on any? I'm on, uh, I'm on in-house as well. In-house, sorry, I, um, I'm, okay. Um, so I think, are there any, I, I, since you're both on one now, if there are any others that you're interested in, let us know, or if you wanna think about it in email, that's fine as well. Uh, also, I'd like which ones are almost done? <laughs> <laughs> Fire nowhere. Final draft. Oh, no. There are some opinions that you guys haven't encountered yet that have not been discussed in a meeting because they're still in the works and those might pique your interest too. So if you want okay. to hold off until we do come around to some of the opinions, like, you know, you've seen the title of the opinion, you think, oh, that might be interesting, but I don't know what it's about yet. You may want to wait or you may want to, you can ask us for the previous draft and we're happy to share that with you just so you can get an idea of where that opinion or what that opinion that's being worked on is about. Yeah, let's wait and see what else is out there. Take door number three. <laughs> I think the only other thing to briefly discuss is, um, Mimi, which which opinion, I apologize, I had it up. I, was, uh, was Kyla the lead drafter on? Uh, Kyla's opinion, uh, hold on. 21002, attorney as advocate. She was supposed to take that up and I mean, she might've come up with an issues outline, but I think that's as far as it got. Um, no one else was assigned to that opinion except Sarah. I think you might've been assigned as an advisor, but that was just very recently, obviously. Yeah, I don't I don't think I'm on that one. At least I, maybe I missed it. It wasn't on the... Yeah, so you that were one where normally? I think I just I went back and forth an and she was skeptical about whether it was going to work out. Was that like a while ago where we last discussed that? Because I think 21... the conclusion that we were dropping it. July 30th, 2021 was the last time we looked at it. Yeah. No, wait. Yes, that was the last time we looked at it. I, I'll, I'll take a look at it one more time because I remember talking to her about it, but I think that one was going to get dropped. Okay, well... And then we can take that off the agenda. So just let us know for the next meeting whether it can be removed. 
And then I just want to let everybody know, remind everyone one more time that if you would let, we're going to set up the SharePoint site next week. If you want a different email address than you've been receiving communications from us from, um, please let us know what that email address is so that we don't have to recreate your account twice. Okay, sounds good. And Raquel, I see you have your hand raised, so I just want to let open it up. Um, so how how would we get on the agenda to talk about the executive director strategic plan that she gave to us? How, how does that, because it doesn't fit in new topics for you know, opinions. I think we can see if we, it, it can fit into the one of the upcoming meeting agendas. Okay. And consider it for that. And I also think that might be a good way to kind of think about that as we come up with topics for the symposium and also for new ethics opinions. Um, it kind of overlaps to some extent. We could, we could kind of combine that discussion. Okay. Thank you. When you guys send me ideas for the ethics symposium, please include at least a couple sentences, not just, hey, we should talk about fee agreements. Okay, what about fee agreements? It'd be more helpful and obviously more productive if you guys give me a short blurb. It only has to be like maybe two or three sentences at most, um, but just so we have some sort of idea of what you're thinking. About oral fee agreements. <laughs> <laughs> Raquel, to answer a, a bit more your question regarding the strategic plan, um, the thought, so new opinion topics was intended to be a standing item on the agendas going forward. One to touch base and see if we want to take anything off. I don't necessarily think it has things have to be added every time, um, but also it, it was intended to allow for addressing some of the concepts and ideas that were mentioned in the strategic plan. So that it, we didn't perhaps get there at this meeting, but we could always talk about it at the next meeting. Okay, I appreciate that. It seemed like it's uh, not any one area, but in some ways stepping back and sort of hearing what sure. we what we think of what we saw and then you know versus just ha having heard it and then just move on without being explicit collectively well the one the one thing i know from the past raquel is that if you're interested in a topic just speak up, you can get it to Mimi, but also be prepared for the fact that unless there's somebody who's gonna stand behind it and see it through, it's not gonna get done either. So look for topics that are interested to you too, and that you'd like to pursue, so. Yeah, my, 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 um... Suggestion on talking about it is, as I say, I think it has a whole context. So I, I don't have any particular topic that I would say, oh yeah, we oh. should do or we shouldn't do or I wanna do. I just think it came over the top and said like, oh, this, these are some things I think you all should be thinking about. And I think we should think about them, but not fragmented as, individual items but in this collective what is it what does it say to us and what do we think about that um because my sense is there's things in there that from what i've heard are of a different order than what the committee has been working on over okay thanks Carol. and i i do agree we, we really didn't get a chance to talk about it or after the presentation was made. So it's it's worth considering more. And um, I'll look at the agenda for the next meeting and see if we can, at, I think we can find a time slot to discuss it more. All right, well, thank you everyone. Um, I propose we uh, adjourn the meeting. Oh, why? I'll second that. <laughs> but Sarah, it was a very productive meeting. <laughs> one of our most. <laughs> I, I still, I, I still love the in-person one the last time, but this is also very good. I'm glad we had a lot of discussion on this virtual one as well. All, All right. right. Well, thank okay. you, and Bye. happy holidays to everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.